get off these rides. That's the one. Hey, if you're taking that knowledge, I'm not going to be on the call of duty, but thank you for your service to our community. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On behalf of the Santa Cruz members of First Retreat, I'm delighted to welcome you here. We're on the post, and our staff seems ready to assist in any way. Just a couple of hours behind this large assembly room we call our sanctuary, either to the right or straight ahead. We have done all of the uh, sanitizing and uh, careful uh, attention to your safety. There are hand sanitizers just about everywhere through the sanctuary and the whole facility. And we just ask you if you uh, can be sure that you're not seated immediately behind another person in the sanctuary, then that will give you adequate distance. Uh, slide over to one side or another if you find yourself looking right at somebody's back of their head. Let me lead us in a, oh, and I do want to mention, if you need coffee, we have a coffee machine that dispenses fresh, both decaf and regular. It's in our art gallery. Go out to the sanctuary and turn right, and uh, it is free for you today. As long as you put a cap on it, you're welcome to bring it back into this assembly room. May I lead us in a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for these leaders, and I pray especially for them this day and in the days and months to come as we face interesting and unexpected challenges, yet you have raised up these men and women to lead us and to guide us, and so I pray that they might have wisdom that they might have unity as much as possible, that they might be able to understand and think carefully and articulate clearly the issues that are before us. I pray that you will protect the, these men and women of our council and our staff in their physical health from illness and danger and give them uh, the clear mental focus to be the leaders we need. Oh Lord, we love our country, we love our community. We pray that God might Bless America. Amen. Councilman Jesse Purton, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? With pleasure, Mr. Mayor. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can we get her lights down so she can stay? Could we do that? Really, I just keep in the office. What's your sunglasses? You want some sunglasses? Maybe these lights right here. Could could we hit these? The lights in the center. That's for the. That's, Thank you that's very for much. the video. Oh, is it for the video? Yeah. Oh, it's for the video. Well, you see, it's right there. It's for the video. Can we just hit her seat so she can stay? And be with us? I know. I have sunglasses if you want them. We can all break out sunglasses, see which ones are the coolest. Huh? We could all wear our sunglasses and make her comfortable. <laughs> I'm down. Yeah, it doesn't gives you spots in front of your eyes. Don't look up there. Roll top, please. Here. 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 Great. Well, welcome, everybody. And uh, we're working through some technical difficulties, but we're very happy to be here. And obviously, because of social distancing, we have the space here to be here. Uh, we did have our first city council meeting together two weeks ago, but because of the social distancing restrictions, there were very few people. Actually, if you had public comment, you came in from the door, so this allows a lot more space, and we're sincerely grateful for that. Um, I'd like to welcome a friend of mine, Mayor Kevin Ruane, who also serves as our president with the Florida League of Mayors. Uh, to give us an update on the Lake Okeechobee release schedule. And uh, this has been placed on the agenda as item. Uh, and because of time constraints, I'm going to make a motion that we move this up. And this is green sheet number 20-05-127. Uh, Mayor Ruane has another meeting that he has to be in at, in Sanibel either at 11 or 11.30. So for 
Uh, I'd like to move that up. Uh, I'd make a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Roll call, please. Aye. Aye. Mayor Ruwain, and while Mayor Ruwain's making his way up, I'll just take this opportunity as a Red Sox fan to say that it depends on how you're looking at Major League Baseball these days, the Red Sox are undefeated or that the Yankees still haven't won a game. But I think hopefully we'll address that come 4th of July. But Mayor Ruwain, my good friend, as you can tell, welcome. Thanks for being here. League of Mayors. Um, I come to you today to bring something to your attention. The last two years, we probably have had the best conditions um, in the waterways in 19 and 20. Um, you go out there and you certainly enjoy what has taken place. We selectively with the Army Corps, as well as the Water Management District, have really managed the lake to the best of their ability. I don't think we could have done a better job. However, um, there is a group that has um, lashed but to the end of uh, last season, filed a lawsuit because the Army Corps, as well as the Water Management District, has been holding the lake lower than they normally have. So in holding the lake lower, the concern, obviously, is from water supply interest not to get enough water. That's really been the concern. Back in, and I'll give you a little history quickly so you understand where we are in the process. So in 2000, and 2000 actually, there was a different schedule called Water Supply and Environment. 2008 came lowers 2008, and now we're in the process of LOSM. So 20 years ago, there was a process, and inside that, they actually lobbied Congress to have WSE 2000 as part of the Water 2000, and were successfully in doing so. 2008, they realized there was many changes to go through and, and do this. Um, and, and made the appropriate changes. The same has taken place with LOSUM. It's been going on for about two years. So what's going on right now is they're looking for an adoption of an old schedule and a clause you'll hear is the savings clause. It predominantly saves water for water supply interest. It holds the lake higher than it should be. It also um, continues to make sure that water supply is the main beneficiary of water. Um, unfortunately, we're 20 years advanced since that scheduling, and we, you know, have advocated and indicated that the estuaries are just as important, um, and we want to have a fair, equitable share. Um, they are trying to insert language into LOSM, and they, meaning water supply, so that's ag, that's citrus, that's sugar, all those groups are done that. I'm um, really precipitated with them trying to file a lawsuit because the lake was held too low. Now, ironically enough, the lake actually, the vegetation in the lake, when you bring it down um, to a lower level, it actually improves and helps us for the season. Um, so it's been an issue. The East Coast have advocated that we could probably get it below the beneficial use ban, which is below 10 and a half. That gives them some anxiety, and rightfully so. Um, we currently are around 11.1. .1. I bring it to your attention because there's going to be a lot of conversation. And right now, during the pandemic, everybody's worried about what you're worried about. You're not worried about water. You're not worried about the issues that Congress is dealing with. We're worried about CARES. We're worried about funding. We're not necessarily looking at this issue. And slowly but surely, um, there's a group um, that have asked a congressman um, up in uh, D.C. to actually, uh, Congressman Hastings, to actually sponsor wording to actually would include that inside the LOSM process. We're going to obviously push back as hard as we can. And I'm not looking to deprive water supply of their water. That's not my mission today. That's not. What I'd like to do is have fair, equitable treatment. On the low flow issues, we need our 600, 650 CFS. On the higher fly issues, I don't want any more than 2,800 CFS. It's really that simple. I bring it to your attention just because in the day-to-day -day life we're living right now with so much of our attention, rightfully so, is paid to our constituents, is actually trying to help them through these really challenging times. It is very easy for this language to be inserted our Congress is operating in um, a part-time environment to have this put through and not necessarily see the attention that it deserves. More importantly, to see this put, be put through, you know, quietly and, and really with no one bringing notice to it. And more importantly, we're not advocating against it. Um, that's why I bring it to your attention. Um, it is something that I'll send to your mayor. There's a 10-page paper we put together on this. It kind of explains the process. 
Uh, but I'd like us to move forward. Lowson was a great process. It was two years of public participation. Everybody had an opportunity to weigh in on that. Uh, all the mayors did and, and many, many cities did throughout the process. I do believe it'll um, equitably divide water, allow us to all benefit from it. Um, and if there's a shortage, um, the shared adversity is something we're all should participate in. Right now, we're going through some water shortage issues. We're not watering our lawns as much. We're not doing anything of that nature. So we understand the participation when we get to those issues. Um, but right now, what's really taking place is, is just a group looking to try to do something um, that would be inconsistent and be very detrimental to our, uh, our coast as well as the East Coast. They're working with us in conjunction. My intent, you're the fourth municipality I've been to. I have one remaining, uh, which will be a sterile. All have embraced this process. Um, right now, we're just waiting and seeing, because right now there's no actual um, language or a bill that we can oppose or any type of insertion. Um, it's been lobbied. Um, we're aware of it. It's been brought to our attention. I want to make you aware of it, and at some point in time, we might need to all come together. I'm trying to go around and educate people in this process so they understand when you hear water savings, it sounds like a great word, a great clause, but you know, it's really not intended to have the, the yesterday participate in the savings. I'll break there. No, th thank you, Mayor Wayne. Thanks for being here. And as one that's worked as one of your wingmen or wing, you know, w part of your team on these issues, your leadership is very much, um, you know, very much it n never been more pr uh, maybe pr prevalent than right now. And you've been active for a long time, my friends. So as, um, as, as you move on uh, to a new elected official and a new capacity, um, or in, at uh, some point here soon as one that will carry this message uh, to, to the next level and to all levels of the state of Florida and around the United States, quite frankly. Um, thinking back to our um, environmental uh, resolution last summer at the United States Conference of Mayors, but within the state of Florida, I just want to say what um, I'd like to maybe offer a letter of support for what, what you're advocating for um, from the city of Benita Springs. I'd like to hear questions. I'd like to um, start with Amy and, uh, and go up and down the horn here, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to make that motion. Is there a second for that? And then we'll have discussion. Okay. Thank you. Amy. Um, I, I want to ask him a couple of questions. I'm in support of that, but we might want to do it something different, all right? Because depending on how his answer is. I'm curious because so, so much of the uh, media has been reported, we've gotten a, co a number of conflicting comments from people who have some prominence within the state of Florida. But, um, so I'd like to get your opinion about why that is so, because it seems like, from what I understand about what the issue is, that we should all be on board with what you're saying. Um, the second thing is, what is the stance of our um, local uh, like Francis Rooney, who's our representative here. I haven't heard anything from him. And it seems to me that where we should focus this attention is on our House member, uh, be it our local one or some that are on the other parts of Florida, because uh, I think that's where we should be doing our advocacy. Um, so you can respond. First of all, I want to thank you for responding so timely to my email from the last meeting when I was curious about what was happening and because I had been reading things in the paper, and you clarified it for me very well. So I think anyone that reads your commentary would, would be very much in support of what you're advocating for. So. I appreciate that. What we have to do is come up with a 10-page paper to really clarify this. Um, right now, the action, um, I've certainly been in contact with Congressman Rooney's office. He's aware of this. Congressman Hastings, just for the record, is a Florida representative. So he's a Florida congressman actually s potentially supporting this. That's the rumor that's out there. That's what's floating. Obviously, Congress hasn't had an opportunity to get together, so that's been some issues. You know, the water savings clause is one that gave water supply great anxiety over this last year because we have historically held the lake a lot higher. So when the lake got down last year to 10.87, and this year it's at 11.1, there's concerns, and people think that because we have a drought right now, and we're not watering our lawn, it has something to do with Lake Okeechobee. Okay, that's the furthest thing from the truth. So you play on obviously the optics that are going on right now. You plan the fact that we're in a drought. You plan the fact that we've released too much water from the lake. 
Um, the issue that is really at hand is that this was a 20-year-old process, and we've learned so much from the times over 20 years. We also have galvanized and come together as a group, recognizing that our tourists, our real estate values are impacted by these. So together as a group, we're much more organized. We're much more together as one group, um, you know, obviously advocating for what we believe in. And I think that's the major difference right now. Um, to take action, you know, and, and I appreciate all that as a support. At some point in time, I've been in contact with um, all people, but most importantly to not only Drew Bartlett, he's the executive director from the Water Management District, but also Colonel Kelly to indicate where he is. Until there's actually language on the floor or potentially language to vote on and or incorporate, you know, we're fighting a ghost at the moment. We've heard about this. They filed the lawsuit. I think the lawsuit will have effects of what will come as a result of this. I don't think they'll win in the lawsuit, but I think what they're trying to do is get attention to this issue that the lake's been, hot, you know, obviously managed too low. I think the most important thing that is really in our favor is if you look at the last two years, we basically have managed the waterways with no projects coming online, with no dollars whatsoever, and the waterways have never been cleaner. They've never been purer. The water's never had a better color to it. So to change the process right now, I applaud the Water Management District and the Army Corps working together in concert to actually talk about it on a daily basis, to talk about what takes place on a weekly basis. We participate in a weekly phone call. We really give our comments, James Evans from the city of Sanibel and many other people, indicating what should take place. And I like the process, and what is most disturbing to me is after two years of public comment, all of a sudden it's like, we don't like the process, we're gonna sue, all of a sudden we're gonna get some member of Congress, and I want water supply to have their water. I want people to be able to grow whatever crops they have, and people have received what they're supposed to, but not at my expense, and my expense being the estuaries, and my expense being Southwest Florida, and my ex expense being as the president of the League of Cities, understanding that we need to have this fair and equitable. So, so you think it might be a little too early to do really uh, intensive political action at this time? Right, right now. Do we even know where we should write a, a letter? Right, well, that, so you ask very good questions, and why I say to pause, is right now, I'm not necessarily certain there's a bill yet. Talked about it, heard all about it, heard who the congressman's gonna be, heard the insertion. I've talked to Colonel Kelly, talked to him on a regular basis. I just was in a task force meeting just last week with him, talked about this specific issue as part of the conversation, talking with Drew Bartlett, Chauncey Goss is the chairman. So we have very good intel on understanding what it is, but until there's actually some document, something that we're advocating against, I wouldn't give you five or six or seven or eight points to consider as a rebuttal because right now we just have heard that they filed a lawsuit and we heard that they want to challenge this. So I'm just trying to bring it to people's attention. It's front and center. We will certainly first and foremost send a document that's 10 pages. I think it's very educational. It's very easy to follow. You can actually give you charts for what they used to hold the lake at back in 2000 or 2008 and charts from 2008 to current, and you'll see the difference. We're not getting enough water during the dry season. We're getting too much water during the wet season. And in 20 years, we've gotten better. So I'll send that to you. I think that's the first start. I'll continue to do, and really what we're trying to do is give all the cities an update on this, because you need to be aware, um, and this is just something we didn't want to see creeped up in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden we get caught blindsided. So basically a heads up. Thank no, you. Thanks, thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you so much. At your direction, I, I will amend my motion to change the directive that I would like to, on behalf of the city of Bonita Springs, reach out. I'd like to call Colonel Kelly. I'd like to call uh, Drew Bartlett and um, Chauncey Goss mm -hmm. on behalf of the city of Bonita Springs. That's what I'll change. Yes. I'd like okay. to do that. Yes. Yeah, but basically what we're saying is that we're advocating for staying the course as articulated by the, this group that's been working on this for a number of years and uh, to, 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 help, to help to do all they can to support that effort. And most efficient way, and quite frankly, the process that we've achieved, just go out and look at the water. Okay. I don't have any other clear evidence and look at the water. Okay, thank you so much for all you've done because um, it's a technical issue that is not that easy to follow. Um, so we appreciate the effort and helping to clarify for us and making our job easier.
Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Jesse. Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's great to see you. Um, I'd also like to second what uh, Councilwoman Crumba said on the, on the follow-up email regarding the entire, uh, you know, soup, soup to nuts version of, of this. You really boiled it down in a way that was um, something that we could consume and understand, and it is a really complex issue. So it, it made it easier for me consumption-wise, and I appreciate it. Um, I've admired your water policy since 2014 because you are one of the few people in Southwest Florida, and I put Chauncey Goss, Martha Simons in that group, that thought water was cool before it was really a big issue. So you were talking about this before it was, it was the big thing. And then COVID came, and you've been rock steady on your continued uh, commitment to water quality. And Southwest Florida has to thank you for that. I thank you for that personally. And uh, you know, as we move forward, if you come up with a ballpark timetable and when you think Hastings, Congressman Hastings or whoever is going to actually do the bill, you know, let us know. If it's in a timetable that's going to be before an election and we have 10 people currently running for Congress that want to represent us, I'm not saying we say, hey, do you want to support the bill? But yeah, maybe we ask the 10 if they want to support the bill. And then that gives us an idea of, of what we're dealing with. Not saying that you support them or don't based on that, but it gives us as a city an idea of what we're potentially looking at in regards to leadership on, on, on probably the most significant issue we face. So once again, I thank you for your continued com commitment to water quality. So thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, say thank you for your leadership on this. Greg. Yeah, I, I want to compliment uh, Mayor Wayne. You might want to get the microphone. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have a wire. That's good. I can slide around. The, uh, I think one thing we ought to also do besides what we've talked about is water quality, which is a 365 day a year problem. We need to put it up in that our strategy priorities besides flooding. Flooding happens maybe every five to ten years. Water quality problems can happen almost every year. Sometimes they have. So I think we should do that and I really think Kevin's done a wonderful job and I expect him to continue it. Great. Thanks, Ma Mayor, I just have one yes. other, other thought. Do you think at some point we would entertain uh, using the services of our lobbyists? You know, I think it's too early to do it now, but Maybe we should, you know, we don't have to make a decision today, but I just would like everybody's opinion whether that you think that might be useful in this, not in every area, but this is an area that I think is so critical to our, our city. I see. You know, I mean, it's too early because we don't have a bill, but, you know, I. Conceptually, that's, I mean, there, if there was something that we were going to use them for, right. it needs to be water quality. So I would support. Well, it's a very spe specific project. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we could all think about it for a couple more months. I do appreciate um, your efforts and I do appreciate your camaraderie with us and working side by side. This issue um, is one that um, a long time ago I just connected the economy and our way of life. Um, so it's a passion I've had, I'll continue to have. Um, I'm glad to have the opportunity to be the president of Florida League of Mayors and bring it throughout um, my leadership. It's been my number one priority for a long time, but not only just locally, but now I have the state behind me. I can assure you we'll continue to stay on it. Um, on Sanibel, it's on our agenda, every single agenda. It's on the old business. And we just have water quality and quantity. So any issue that comes up, you talk about it. But your lobbyists are really going to be effective once we understand what we're lobbying against and we have the bullets associated with it. And we'll come to collectively together. The most important thing I want you to be aware of is some people um, may not necessarily understand the gravity of this situation. This could be a game changer. We've waited too long for LOSUM to come through. And just for the record, it's Lake Okeechobee schedule of operating manual. It's a new, improved version. We've waited 12 years now and going to wait another two more years. So to put something in place, you know, waiting 14 years to go back to 20, 2000, go back 20 plus years, just seems to be we're much better as a country. We can do much better than that. And I really just continue to make sure we want to make progress. And progress isn't going 20 plus years backwards. No, a a absolutely, uh, Mayor Wayne. Thank you. I want to thank you once again for being here. And, I, you know, it really, um, as one that will um, say that I was into clean water before it was cool, too, I'll, I'll dive right in there. I was there, right? 
Oh, Simmons, he's from New Hampshire. We see him coming. Yeah, well, in the woods of northern Maine. And Mother Nature was always a part of our life. So it certainly was by the time I got to Florida in my 40s, it was still. And meeting you and working together. Um, and it's really a, it's a simple premise, but uh, obviously a lot of work and a complex way to resolve it. But our environment is our economy. And our economy is our environment. And if we can all keep that in mind, which I know we do, but your leadership um, has been amazing. And I just uh, thank you for being here today. And I just want to ask uh, Arlene or Matt or Derek, do you have any questions for Mayor Ruane or anybody? No, because I'm Matt, you know, certainly we're doing some great things here uh, um, with our bioreactor and other things, a way of basically taking Malaluca, right? Just to kind of go off topic here for a second, taking Malaluca, grinding it up and pulling nitrogen out of our water. So I know, you're, you, you know, Sanibel has been an environmental steward above and beyond, and uh, we're just uh, pretty proud of our environmental record down here in Bonita Springs that's getting better by the day. So thank you. I appreciate that effort. It's really important um, that you embrace water quality issues locally. It's easy for us to advocate as we all talk about the local things we're doing. We're walking the walk and talking the talk. Our responsibility enables us when we do things for water quality, when we're advocating for water quality, we're looking for those projects, those big, big infrastructure expensive projects, we at least could demonstrate that we're doing our end. And I appreciate all you're doing on that. It's amazing work. Um, it's just been an honor to do this. Um, it's going to be somewhat um, different. Um, either I'm going to uh, continue forward or I'm going to retire. But um, either way, water will certainly be something I won't walk away from. Um, as someone that grew up in New York, most people know, and, and Mayor always gives me a hard time, but you know, we fell in love with the Jersey Shore when I was really young. Um, and water to me is just something that I can't imagine. I was involved when I saw hypodermic needles um, washing up on the Jersey Shore in the 80s. So it's just it's something that we need to understand and not take for granted. Right. It's too, no. too precious a commodity. No, no, absolutely. Um, Thank you very much, and I'm going to go back to my, unless there's any other questions or comments from Mayor Ruane, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so b before, and I'm going to, like I said, amend my um, motion to read that I'll reach out to Colonel Kelly, uh, Drew Bartlett, and Chauncey Goss on behalf of the uh, City of Bonita Springs to check in and follow up with what Mayor Wayne's talking about. Uh, that would be my motion. Is there a second for that? Second. And there's a second. Is there? But before we take a vote, I'm going to uh, on that open it up to public comment on what what the discussion is that we just had, or the direction um, from the City of Bonita Springs. Would anybody like to speak from the public? Of Councilwoman Simons, hello. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Welcome. Council. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for being here. I have one question for you. Are the Yankees going to be the uh, Red Sox this year? Uh, <laughs> yay, thumbs Another up. Uh, yeah, I, I know. Yeah. Like I said, it's nice I'm to work. I'm outnumbered. I'm outgunned. It's nice to work in a bipartisan manner, right? <laughs> so um, I, I want to thank you, uh, Mayor Wayne, for, you know, and, and Sanibel leadership for decades, you know, for being on this uh, question of how we're going to keep our waters clean. You guys are on the forefront. and. I'm glad Benita Springs has been able to join you over the years. Um, I would say go for it, guys. I mean, and, and the idea of having our lobbyist, however many forces we can get, the better. I know um, years ago we were able to uh, awaken the forces in East Benita about water issues and had lots of commentary going to South Florida Water Management and the Army Corps from there, you know, just. Pelican Bay, I mean, Pelican Landing, Bonita Bay, you know, get your forces together, the people in your districts to write letters, to back up, um, you know, what the mayor is bringing to us. So the more they hear from us, the better. Right. And so not just our lobbyists, but our people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other members of the public that would like to speak? This is not good. Okay, seeing none, there's a motion on the floor. With a second, is there further discussion? Roll call, please. Aye. Councilman McCarr? Aye. Mayor Simmons? Aye. Councilman Corey? Aye. Councilman Gibson? Aye. Councilman Forbes? Aye. Councilman McCarumba? Aye. Okay, thank you. We're going to actually now open it up again for public comment on any agenda items. 
Anything else? Thank you, Mayor. Drive safe. Um, Dwight, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Mayor, Council Members. For the record, Dwight Usman from the Paradise Road area. I'm also speaking for Barbara Ogle from my neighborhood and for Linda Schwartz from Cedar Creek. I hope you'll allow me to reference some items from the last meeting. I was extremely surprised that CBRE was so optimistic about the economy and about our downtown development bids. One of the members mentioned that we could go to their website, find trends in the industry. Well, I went to the website. I didn't find anything that was useful. They did not point to any example of a city, or even an owner for that matter, pushing ahead on a similar project when, when the bids were due right now. They talked about some that were already committed, uh, but none were at this stage of the development. They also mentioned that they would expect to see three to seven bids on each property in order to have a viable choice. I hope we've received at least three bids. I'm assuming we'll find that out soon. I also want to echo Chris Corey's comment. There will be vacant commercial space that is less expensive than any new space coming online in the next year or so. The trends that were already started will accelerate even after COVID-19 is gone. Online ordering is going to kill retail shops. Delivery and takeout will mean less frequent uh, in restaurant dining and working from home is going to cut back on the need for uh, office space. The past have been tremors. COVID-19 is the earthquake that is going to change and become the new normal. I also want to say I agree with Al Greenwood from Buffalo Chips. Uh, we must not allow food trucks into the city until our existing restaurants have had a chance to cope with the new normal. And I want to commend Martha Simons for reminding everyone that the people voted overwhelmingly to stop elected officials, including city officials for the first time, from lobbying while in office or for six years after leaving office. In Lee County, almost 83% of the voters supported that ban. But for some reason, elected officials were given four years to comply. State officials were already barred for two years after leaving office, but that did not apply to city officials. So I hope this council will follow the will of the people and enact a lobbying ban to take effect at the end of this year, two full years after the voters approved the amendment. I also want to thank Laura Carr for reminding us that CBRE gets $7,500 a month as our consultant. And I want to thank whoever came up with the idea of using the church for the meeting because this works so much better than it did the last time at City Hall. And I'm, I questioned whether I was going to say this or not, but the comments from last meeting that were emailed in were not read. Um, so I don't really feel like that makes those comments public because not all of you had a chance to read them. So I hope there's a way to read the comments that come in via email. Um, thank you all for your time. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Other members of the public that would like to speak on agenda items? Uh, seeing none. I have a question. Yeah. Procedurally, procedurally, can I ask Esmond a question? Are uh, we allowed uh, to do that? No? No. Mayor, I was just trying to be polite and let other people step forward. And yeah, I want to echo, <laughs> oh, it sounds like an echo chamber. Uh, what Dwight said about making accommodations here. I want to thank the church. Um, I want to thank uh, the city council and staff. It's very thoughtful. And thanks for being so conscientious about the COVID. It's not every government that's doing that. And uh, you are, and I really appreciate that. We have a lot of elderly here. We have people with compromised immune systems that you know, want to participate, and uh, you're allowing that. So I really want to thank you. I also want to see Laura Carr up front. You know, why is she sitting in the back? And she was even bad. Come on, <laughs> Come on down. All right. There she is. All right. Good, Laura. I mean, you know, no offense, move the lawyer off, you know, but, um, you know, for social distancing. But 
Um, one thing I want to speak about is I'm kind of disturbed about this um, discussion about the resignation of a zoning board member. It's hard to recruit these non-paid volunteers who give lots of hours to put their perspective and understanding and expertise into um, making recommendations to you on zoning. And I just kind of feel that this shouldn't even be a public discussion. Um, no offense to the mayor, but I, I would hope you just withdraw this and just say, let's start back at day, you know, two before stuff was mailed and, and just, you know, let's just not talk about this publicly because I'm afraid that this will discourage other people who might need to fill the place of somebody who doesn't want to continue working on the zoning board and just having a public discussion about what's kind of a personal opinion. I, I just really, it just, I'm verklempt. <laughs> you know, what do they say gobsmacked in England. Um, the other thing is about the downtown um, bids. City council paid, or the city, um, negotiated like a $350,000 price for that lemon tree property. It's pretty expensive. It was just a little kind of trailer up on a blocks and they served breakfast and lunch and that was it. And it was adjacent to our park. So one of the thoughts was when they bought that property, and you can see actually that it's under parks and rec because it was an amendment to the park. It's kind of like selling off part of our park. When we have um, events in the past, I'm not sure today, but in the past, I mean, we've used it for where we need to put the dumpster and some of the trucks and some of the utility stuff. And um, the lemon tree was not something that we were going to sell for redevelopment. The lemon property, we did buy that for redevelopment. That's across the street from. Thank you, sir. And I appreciate that. I don't have my little blinking light. I don't know if you can fix that. Okay, so the Levin property was bought for redevelopment, but the lemon tree property was actually supposed to be like part of the park, and I really hope you don't sell it. The other thing is it does kind of make up for a loss of parking for the Strand building. The, um, it's not called the Strand now, it's called Sheer Unity. Uh, the old, it was an old grocery store, or Myrtle's upholstery. Uh, we've called it many things, just like the Dixie Moon, but please don't sell the lemon tree property. It's just, it wasn't meant, bought to be sold. Don't sell it. There's other stuff you want to sell. It's a bad time to sell. You look at market trends, they're going down. I don't think we need the money that much right now. I know that you have to make up for grants, you know, matching funds. So look at- seconds, uh, Martha. Thank you, sir. Uh, so please, and, and again, I hope you withdraw this thing about the zoning board, and thank you again, council, for having a meeting here. Thanks for being here. Anybody else from the public that would like to speak at this time? Okay, seeing none. I'll move on to the consent agenda. Council, what's your pleasure? So move. Second. Motion to accept A, B, C, D, and E. Correct. And a second. Council, further discussion? Roll call, please. Well, well Jesse, go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, E, the reason that it got pulled last time was because if you noticed on that grant, Lee County Sheriff was notably off of that grant, and it was Lee County Port Authority, it was Cape Coral Police, it was Fort Myers Police. They were getting uh, electronic readers for plates and all kinds of things. Long story short, we pulled it because we wanted to make sure that the sheriff understood and was happy with it, and they ferreted it out, and this was actually the original program that got us the pill officer way back in the day in downtown. When they stopped using the money, it got allocated to the sheriff's department. Those dollars went away, and you can't retroactively recreate the position. So to do what they were doing before, they would have lost money overtime-wise, bottom line. So they knew they were out of it, and they thanked us very much for looking into it, but that's, that's what it was. So that's why it's back for the third time now, but it's done now. Okay. Thank you. Council, anything else? Item C, Chris, thanks. On the, uh, the green sheet regarding the uh, transfer for the sidewalk projects, I was just curious as to when those sidewalk projects will be completed on Maddox and Cockleshell. Yeah. I'll, let, uh, I'll point to Arlene and then Arlene will point to Matt. There we go. <laughs> so those are package 
so that we can advertise them for public bid. That process is about three months. Um, so they're not out to bid yet, but they probably will be at some point in early June uh, based on the engineer's progress. Um, Imperial Shores on that list is actually a, li a little bit behind in that time frame that I just gave you. Um, from there, they'll go into construction at some point in the fall and probably wrap up in the spring um, in terms of timelines. Each one has an individual, you know, different timeline and it will play out as we get through the bid process. But they're basically in the final throw before we have pricing for council to consider and then moving to construction, which would start in the fall. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Council, anything else? Roll call, please. Councilwoman Carr. Aye. Mayor Simmons. Aye. Councilman Corey. Aye. Councilman Gibson. Aye. Councilman Forbes. Aye. Councilwoman Carumba. Aye. Councilman Purden. Aye. Great, thanks everybody. We're gonna move on to uh, Roman numeral eight, proclamations and presentations. Item A is we're gonna receive a presentation from city staff regarding mitigation efforts and preparedness activities related to hurricane season, and this is green sheet 20-05123. Good morning, good, welcome. Good, good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, as you know, June 1st is hurricane season, and although we have actively been responding to COVID-19, we do need to also remind everyone that we work year-round, our staff works year-round in preparation of hurricane season. Uh, COVID-19 provides a, a, a different challenge for us through this process, but we have continued communications with Lee County Emergency Services, and we just wanted to provide an update for residents that we are prepared for the season and let you know the activities that we've been involved in, and I'll turn it at this point over to Tony and Laura to give you the presentation. Great, thank you. Good morning. Uh, from Manager and Neighborhood Services. If I could have the next slide, please. Can you step into the mic a little yeah, bit, Tony? Oh, okay. You got a better accent than I do, just remember that. <laughs> I'm New England, you're England straight up. <laughs> so uh, uh, the premise of how we, are, we work, uh, we work in, in line with FEMA and uh, obviously our local partners as well as the EOC. We work on the emergency management cycle which is four major components which is mitigation, preparedness, response and recovery. And we've adapted and adopted the, the premise that ongoing mitigation and preparedness will improve response and recovery. So this presentation, along with um, Laura following me here, uh, is, is to give some information and some visual representation of, of what we have done uh, as we work through in preparation for, for the 2020 hurricane season. If we could have the next slide, please. So one of the major uh, strategic priorities for, for Mayor and Council is stormwater. And we want to try and show the importance of where stormwater fits in, especially with regards to, to hurricane preparedness. So what we've done is, is identify existing stormwater conveyance systems within the city that are in need of, of, of work. And we subsequently have worked with the property owners. Um, we're liaising with them to, to get as much done as we possibly can in preparation. And we, we actually, again, and there's some statistics to come, pretty good compliance with regards to it's actually pretty stunning compliance with, with the homeowners, property owners within Bonita. And some of the pictures that you're going to see up there is before and after. Um, these swales ditches are completely overgrown prior to with uh, Brazilian peppers, invasives, grass. And in working in conjunction with them, you can see there's some fairly dramatic results that, that would, would work. If you have the next slide, please. So let me guess. I'll just I'll dive in if we can go back to that picture. But, but to make the point, I'm guessing the picture to the right can handle a whole lot more water and water flow. But do you have a sense of how much more? Uh, I wouldn't be the person qualified to talk on the... Uh, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> And I'm, I'm not even familiar. Manning's but, coefficient? Yes. Which Any is, Manning's which coefficients is the roughness in the of house? the plants. But. Okay. To make the point, though, I mean, but that, that's very good work. I'm impressed. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can I ask you a question real quick while you're at it? Well, you were compiling the lists of the areas that needed attention. How did you compile that list? Was this something you've been building, or was this something that you guys went out and separately went and, and visited the areas? 
the basic premise of how we have worked is, is the inspectors that are out there, they're into, they're, we've got four zones for, for the four inspectors that we have. Um, they're out there pretty busy doing code, code enforcement cases. They're identifying areas that they knew specifically from Irma were, were low-lying and did get you know, substantial damage. So anything that we figure we can do to improve whatever they have in existence uh, has got to be an improvement upon what it was prior to, to, to Hurricane Irma. So on pictures like this, for example, this was a low-lying area, and you can see uh, both pictures on the left um, heavily, heavily overgrown. Um, we deal with homeowners associations uh, as well as property owners in particular. Um, we can sometimes see there's some back and forth on who, who accepts the responsibility for, for taking care of it. But let's like say we've, we've managed to, to achieve some fairly dramatic results by, by you know, discussing this. And it, these things don't happen overnight. Um, these things do take a while to get done, as you can see, just the workload involved in, in taking, in specific, the, the top left to the top right picture um, is a pretty, pretty stark difference. So even though I, I'm not familiar with Manning's coefficient, I can say that uh, I would believe that water is going to travel through that conveyance um, far more efficiently on the right-hand side than it would on the left-hand side. I have a question. Yes. Um, I know we have stormwater uh, management model going, so we are, I think we're pretty well aware of where the water comes from and where it goes. It, starting with that model, do you think you have addressed or are aware of problems such as these that have been described in these uh, pictures, like 75% of that conveyance system, or have you pretty much looked at everything, <laughs> or less than that? Or did you just, I, I assume you just you started on what you were certain were problem areas, and then you're expanding beyond that? Is that the, the methodology? Yeah, we've looked at the areas that, that we knew were uh -huh. the worst hit. You know, we, we looked at, at flood areas post, post Irma, mm. and we've worked out from there. Now, our, I, I will be upfront. Our work is far from done. Um, you know, we're continuing to do as much as we can. Mm -hmm. um, there are some fairly large tracks that we've managed to, to, to make pretty good gains on. So I, I would be reluctant to provide a percentage. So. But are there any areas that you're still worried about and trying to work on, or you think you're... There are still areas that we are working on, and mm -hmm. some of the, the, the statistics coming along may give you an idea of, of the next few slides of, of where we are moving and, and how it's going, mm -hmm. um, if, if that's answering your question. Okay, yes, uh, yes, thank you. Council uh, Mayor, um, we also have the dual process as community development continues to review those environmental permits that we're discovering where there's additional areas of concern. So each, we're trying to match the two up together. So you've got two functions going, is, is the eyes on the street and the, and the knowledge we have from Irma, as well as the study areas that we're doing in each section block of the city to determine whose environmental permits are still in compliance. Oh, okay, thank you. If I could have the next slide, please. So this, this here is, is one conveyance system that was in, in disrepair. In disrepair, I mean it was completely overgrown. And the, the top slide on the middle top slide, uh, it's pretty difficult to see from this, but there's actually a line that goes down. It's supposed to come from the top down and across to the left. There are arrows on there. They're just not particularly easy to see. Um, this was a, a big challenge. We had a, an, a homeowners association that no longer existed, and we actually tracked it down to 38 separate property owners. Some were businesses, some were, were, were individual property owners. The compliance we achieved on that was, was pretty dramatic. This is a low-lying area. It is an area that did get uh, hit fairly, fairly hard after Irma. So we wanted to make sure that we could do everything we could, and we worked in conjunction with the property owners, and, and the pictures that kind of skirt around the side of this do show the after on that. And uh, from the existing system, as it, as it was intended, that is probably going to operate as good as it was ever going to, having removed all of the brush from it. If I could have the next slide, please. So since the end of the last hurricane season, we have opened 115 code cases, and we've achieved 92% voluntary compliance. Only 10 cases actually required notices of violation to be served, so there's been a really, really good outreach and there's been good communication back and forth. And only one case did require proceeding to the hearing examiner, 
and that has subsequently been resolved as well as a result of that. And again, there's some pictures. So in preparedness, over and above some of what the mitigation's been, um, back in, I believe it was February, early March, uh, it was brought in front of Mayor and Council, the new emergency operations plan that's been adopted that is in conjunction with FEMA and, and in, in alignment with our local partners and the EOC. Approximately 300 FEMA certif certifications now for city employees, which is, which is very, very good, and that's increasing. We've constantly taken more and more courses at FEMA. We participate in EOC meetings throughout the year. This is a 12-month cycle. Um, you know, a lot of people think hurricane season, it just happens. This is 12 months uh, of continual planning. EOC does a phenomenal job, and they're constantly in contact with us. We've had city staff involvement with local mitigation strategies, and they've had workshops with grant opportunities that uh, individuals from other departments have been working in. And we're currently doing the outreach to the, to the recreational vehicle and the trailer parks, ensuring that they adhere to the state and ordinance regulations for the hurricane season. We do this every year at this time. We go out, we hand out the information regarding tie downs and what is required uh, in there. So that is actually mitigated prior to the season. And if I could have the next slide, please. We're now renewing the contract for the debris removal and monitoring for, the, for this 2020. Hurricane season, ARM360 is a software that is utilized for initial damage assessment. So when we get into the response category of, of following a, a, a major storm incident coming through, the software actually uploads immediately to EOC, so it's, 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 it's far more efficient than using phones when it regards to uh, in relaying information. So there's more of a direct uh, link between us and our major partners. We've designated staff for the city command structure that will match the FEMA incident command system, the ICS system, so everything should be up and running. And uh, even though as, as miserable as this has been going through the pandemic, uh, it has been kind of a, a trial run for, for EOC and all of us to be working in this way. And we've, we've adopted the system even through this. We've now got the appropriate staff that will be trained for those positions in Web EOC, which is the resource request system, the software system that tracks every single request that the city would put through. And we can also monitor that in real time for, for the fulfillment of our requests. And we are still monitoring the agencies. Uh, you know, we got NOAA, uh, probably everybody saw there was, a, there was a tropical storm that just formed off of the, uh, off the east coast out of the Bahamas. Um, which is early outside of hurricane season, and uh, the predictions at this point are it's going to be a busier than usual hurricane season. And we, of course, continue to communicate and liaise with the EOC and all of our other partner agencies that we work with. And that's all I have, and I'll pass it over to Laura. Thank you. Council? Thank you. I'd, I'd love to just say something to you, Tony, real quick. Uh, for those of you <laughs> who are impressed by all of the water stuff he does, I just wanted to give you a shout out for your animal and constituent services. So during COVID-19, I had about five emails from these couple people right in District 2 who, if you go to Boca Grande and you know where the cows are next to the Publix, this, these, they were very worried about the cows, very worried about the cows. I sent all this stuff to Tony within 24 hours. Tony contacted the owner, he went to the site, he took pictures, he had the agricultural unit of Lee County Sheriff out there, had a full report including a weight body fat test of the cows who actually tested well above average. And In their fat content? Yes, yes. And then he sent it all back to the lady with a nice ribbon on it. And then she called me and she was just like head over heels. She couldn't even believe it. But so on top of all of these important water things that are going on, he's also an animal advocate and a constituent service person. And I appreciate your efforts there, Tony. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you. Mayor. Amy? Um, yes. I have two questions. Hang on, Tony. Um, I'm sorry. Um, do we prearrange where we would um, dump our trash? We had a, li a little issue last time where we didn't know where to put our refuge. Do we do that, or do we have to control? If an event happens, we'll have to figure out where to put it. Due to the nature of, of, of storms, they never know where they're going to hit. They never you know where they're coming through. So the predetermination of sites for, for debris, um, even though we have areas 
staging areas pre-planned. It depends on if it comes from the north, south, east, or west. So the predetermination is something that, that anyone involved in emergency management will steer clear of. They have multiple different options. What we've done here in the city, we do have different sites already determined predetermined, it depends on whether the, which way the storm comes. Well, you don't have the commitment until the event happens, is that what you're saying? Yeah, we don't know where we would use until, and, until and we And then my the second happens. question, I, um, with the renovations that have been done at the um, Hertz Center, is that still going to be a shelter, or do we have a shelter? That is, yesterday we was actually on an, uh, a call with the EOC related to, to coronavirus. And they are currently preparing everything regarding hurricane um, and shelter in place and sheltering. That is something that they are working on that I, I can't actually provide a comment on specifically because the, the county at this point are the ones working through that as, as they're developing. Mm -hmm. yeah, of course, it, it's, it's going to be a little, it should be a little different should we have to use them in this environment that we're in, right? So it's a, an, an additional problem that we're going to have to deal with. I think that yeah, there are many, um, mm -hmm. this coronavirus, the COVID-19 thing has, has placed stresses upon all of the emergency management systems. However, the EOC is, is very confident that they're working through everything and mm -hmm. I say the sheltering uh, plans are being worked on as, as we're speaking right now. Okay, thank you. It was also my understanding that the, it wasn't the high school supposed to be, I'm sorry, what, wasn't the high school built to be set up as a shelter too initially? I do not believe so because of the location with uh, uh, flood, uh, flood plain. The, in the initial phases, there was like a whole component about there the was a lot of discussion, yes. and we, we are hopeful. But because of where it sits where physically, correct. I think it correct. was. An it's, it's also in an evacuation right. zone as well. It wasn't for a lack of discussion. At the correct. Time. I, sure. I did want to add also, as far as preparedness, as though I don't know that we have uh, contracts or co complete commitments. Uh, Tony's staff has also done outreach to several locations strategically placed throughout the city um, as points of informational and distribution centers should the need come. So we've, we've made those contacts um, and then determining where, where the storm hits or what the needs are, we would pursue those contacts. Very good. Yes. Very good. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Hi, Laura. Oh, Good morning. Oh, no, no. False, <laughs> false alarm. Chris? <laughs> well, I have one question. Sorry. No, come on back, Tony. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> I have one question. That Please. Is, uh, it's an old carryover item. Uh, the uh, ditch across the Imperial Parkway from the high school, was that situation ever resolved, and is that ditch being cleaned up? Because a lot of water comes under I-75. Uh, from uh, down through that ditch, and the high school didn't want to maintain it. And we well, were there was a proposal that came before the council a few months ago. Yep. Um, you know whether the responsibility was the Lee County School District or the City of Bonita Springs, and this board went back for discussion. Correct. To to say whose responsibility for the ditch that it is. Well, correct. I know that we were in this. Uh, I'll just tell you what I know, and then you can fill in the blanks. We were absolutely in the process of scheduling meetings Correct. with Lee County officials, and then coronavirus happened. Correct. That's so what I know, Marlene. There, there, was a, there was a proposal, but the ditch is owned by the Lee County School Board. There was a request from Lee County School Board um, through Councilwoman Corumba at one point to uh, turn the, the ditch over. Um, in looking at it, it is interconnected to our systems. Um, it would um, be beneficial to, you know, be maintaining those simultaneously, our systems, but uh, it was a proposal of the council to go back to discuss uh, putting in some landscaping along um, Imperial Parkway, and um, we then heard back from the school board that that was a concern of theirs because of uh, their safety mitigation plans that it provide block views of block views for safety reasons. Um, the school board then came back with some additional ideas and as the mayor said at that point we were looking to set up a meeting to discuss how uh, would be an appropriate for both parties before we brought proposals back and forth and unfortunately we haven't been able to meet since then just curiosity from when they reached out to you councilman councilwoman uh, 
so the ditch is owned by, by Lee County School Board, right? So they're getting the impact fees from the building. Impact fees supposed to go to infrastructure. Ditch is infrastructure. So why would the city pay for it? Like, what, was, it, what, it just, what did we it's get? It's just now? the idea of the maintenance, because it's a, what the problem is, from, my, from an operational uh, point of view, with the way I understand it, is that the extent of it is relatively small. And we have, we already have a contractor that goes, and Matt will, could correct me, or we have a facility to take care of all the other things that are connected to it. So we are our big guy that has a big contract. It's a lot more efficient, both to get that done. I think when I spoke with Matt, and I really should let him speak, but this is what my understanding that we wanted to be certain that that portion of the ditch was taken care of up to our standards right. because of its problem, connection to the other thing. So they thought it wouldn't be a bad idea to do it. What, and my understanding from the council is that they thought they should get something for that. I mean, it's an expense. I forget what the 13,000 or something. Yeah. 18, is that? The initial, it, it, initial. The initial thing was 18,000, and, and it's not clear how that would be included in our bigger contracts or what the unguarded expense. So the, count, the, the, the feeling in the council was they wanted to get something for it, and that's where the landscape came up. Okay. And then the last thing that I remember, having talked to some of the other uh, education, uh, the commissioners, was that they, we were all talking to each other, we're trying to get to an agreement. But our intent in the city is to make sure that, that all the conveyances within the, the city are maintained at a high level, and this particular one is kind of critical. Okay. So that's how it all came about, and we're going to resolve. Somebody's going to take care of it, I would hope, before the, I, I don't even know what the state Did you look at that? Is, is that ditch? Has it? This presentation is, is very apropos. Mm -hmm. um, the ditch. From time to time, looks like some of those overgrown ditches that you see. The city has about a $200,000 maintenance contract for everything downstream of it because we are the underlying property owner. Uh, it's the property, it's the ditch that runs along Cordova, or no, um, I can't remember the, the name of the community east of Imperial, but it runs along Hawthorne and then on down and crosses it where Buffalo Chips is. It's um, Rosemary Creek Ditch, basically. And so that remainder costs us 200000 annually. We did get a price for the, the small remnant that runs up along the, the pond that's east of Imperial Parkway, immediately east of the high school. That's the portion that we're talking about. And it, I believe it was 17500 annually to maintain it to the, the level that we're maintaining the remainder downstream. In perpetuity, so that would be... Correct. I mean, so at seventeen grand now, what is the long-term financial impact of that because I mean I don't say we I understand it's important to city infrastructure but at the same time they're getting how much an impact fees what are, I mean we shouldn't I don't think we adopt a financial long-term reoccurring revenues so council asked us to you know basically along the, the thinking that you put forward to, to counter uh, with landscaping and I believe a financial contribution to the landscaping of 40,000 I, th I think over a five-year period uh, the school board countered with something significantly less, and hence the additional discussions. Yeah. Chris, did you have something? No, I no. Would just, I would just encourage us to go back to the school board and, and try to work it out. Uh, yeah, I thought we had a pretty good uh, proposal in place. Uh, I wasn't sure it was worth getting upset about uh, $8,000 a year for landscaping. I thought, I thought we should have gone ahead and and got <clears throat> resolved it with the school. It was also my understanding, if my memory serves me right, that Matt may have said that it's a good place to also put a bioreactor, so we could also benefit uh, from that. If I'm, if I have that memory. With any water quality projects, um, you know, the city being a relatively new city, we're always looking for, literally, for land. Um, so. You know, having control of that ditch, I think there are some areas along that flowway. They might be a little further downstream of that area, but um, where you could do some kind of project or, or something. Mm -hmm. Having it at a better state of maintenance uh, would benefit. It, it is maintained by the county uh, when it crosses Imperial for the school board, and then it, it jumps to the east again, east of the interstate, and it's in private hands at that point. But uh, it does carry quite a bit of water, and uh, if it's in a less than maintained state, 
Manning's coefficient comes into play. Mm. And Manning's uh, coefficient. the water can't get out of there as Once fast. again, there it is. Like it. Okay. I, if, I mean, I, I just, I mean, if there's a bioreactor and environmental component, if there's some kind of give back, I'm fine. And it's not that, to me, it's not that it's the eighteen thousand dollars. It, it's the long term commitment that we have to maintain it in, perpet in perpetuity. When the reality is, at every single year, they're getting a, a ton of money for this high school. What would the um, fees be? The impact fee credits? Is there a way to? Ann? I'd like to weigh in on that. Or is that a more well, the, complicated the, question? That's not, that's the not the not issue is that the impact fees are not eligible for maintenance. Oh, so it would so, just be the first time. So if this was a, a project that the related to a school facility and they were building out a ditch, that'd be one thing. But, but the maintaining impact the fees, they go, they're, they're not for this purpose. And Council Mark, it wouldn't be the first time. This is a ditch that should be maintained under the Land Development Code. So it wouldn't, it's not a, a building of a new ditch. Well, I know we're in the process of getting that meeting rescheduled, as the case may be. So look forward to the meeting, and then we'll report back. OK. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody, anything else at this point? OK, then we're going to move oh, on to. Ma Mayor, the second portion of the presentation <laughs> is uh, Laura Taylor will give an update on our hurricane preparedness for communications. My mistake, Laura Taylor, hello. Good morning. Um, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, so I'm here today to talk to you about public education. Um, the city does follow the FEMA Public Information Guidance Plan. Uh, public education is a process of making the public aware of risks and how they can prepare for all hazards. Prior to any incident, the city shares information to educate the public about local hazards. Um, examples currently are things like storm surge and evacuation zone, are their flood zones, being able to check the flood zones. Upon declaration of a state of emergency by either the county or the state, the city will implement a crisis communication plan and select a spokesperson. That person is typically our mayor. The city shall operate as a support agency to the Lee County Emergency Operations Center. So they will generate most of that information and share it with us and we'll share it on our city platforms. Next slide, please. Um, what we're trying to do at this point is just to make sure that our residents have the information they need to connect with us to get the information when a hurricane happens. So I'm going to review with you a few ways that residents can connect. One of those is, is called Alert Lee. It replaced the code red if you're familiar with that. That happened last year. So Alert Lee is an emergency notification system that allows registered users to receive telephone, text, and email alerts related to any kind of um, emergency. Um, you can subscribe to that by going to www.lee, make sure I get this right, leealert.com, alertlee.com, I'm sorry, www.alertlee.com. Next slide, please. That wasn't a typo, was it? It wasn't. I just can't see that far <laughs> for some and reason. Rooney so had nothing here. to do with this document, right? <laughs> no, he did okay. not touch it. Fair enough. Okay. So there are other, we do have two apps uh, that can be used. The apps are free. The city has an app as well as Lee County. Uh, the city's app and the Lee Prepares app can be uh, purchased for free. You have to just go and download them from the, um, the uh, Apple Store or the Play Store for Androids. Um, so the city's uh, app will allow you to get news straight to your phone. It will also allow you to access any of the city's social media um, the website and uh, take you to emergency information. The Lee Prepares app allows for notifications that the Emergency Operations Center may send out, as well as find my evacuation zone and active evacuation um, orders, shelter information, preparedness tools, and then after the disaster information. Um, so uh, that's a great thing to do. We're encouraging everyone to, to please, please, please go and download the, those apps and connect in every way possible to get this information. Um, we know this year is going to be even more difficult if a storm happens. So um, it's very, very important to make sure that people are connected. Uh, next slide, please. So we also have a web page that allows for our residents to subscribe to their district to get information that is specific to that district. So you can go to our city website, and then um, you will go to this page, and you can literally subscribe your email address, and then if anything happens in your district that's not citywide that you need to find out about, it will be emailed to you. 
Um, we also updated our community contact list just recently. So that's, that was a pretty extensive update and that was completed. So that's another way that we can reach out to our communities. Next slide, please. So lastly, I just kind of want to review the ways that we send information out, the different platforms that the city has. We do have Facebook, Twitter, Nextdoor um, that we push messages out on. We have the eBlast system with approximately 37,000 subscribers. If you want to register to that, you can register by going to the city website. Um, we also have, um, during a storm, we, we deal with uh, a, a lot of media interviews. The mayor takes those. Um, and we do um, signage, we'll put signage everywhere. You know, after a storm, we wanted to make sure that everyone could see where to go for FPL questions, um, where to um, you know, find out information or find a cool spot that they could charge their phone. So we were sharing information just by regular signage at that point. Um, we also um, have channel 98, so as long as that is still up and working, uh, we definitely put information there as well. Um, so there's just a lot of ways to connect and we just encourage everyone to share those to make sure that everyone can get to that information as much and as soon as possible. Lastly, we have been talking to the emergency operations uh, PIO, uh, Betsy Clayton, I'm sure I know you all know, know her. She is working towards putting together some videos um, since it's a little bit different for the hurricane prep at this time. And once those videos are approved, we will be sharing those on our platforms as well. That's all I have for you today. Thank you, Laura. And as I sit here and type away, for us folks that uh, are, aren't old enough to be old and aren't young enough to be young, I went to the app store, so I just, for a little Q&A here, but I wasn't able to pull it up. Well, how's it listed in the app store? Are you okay. looking at the city app or the? Th the this would be uh, Mac, Apple. Okay, but are, are you? Are you doing the City of Bonita Springs app? Just City of Bonita Springs? To download Springs? that app, how, do, how does the public do it the easiest way? So you, you would just go to the search in the app store and right. type in City of Bonita Springs, and it should pull that up, and you would click uh, Under download. Under City of Bonita Springs. Under City of Bonita Springs, click install, and then that would download the app for you, and, and then you would be able to just pull it up right from your home screen. Right. My children will teach me how to do it when okay. I go home, I can but help I, you I well. promise yeah. it, it's, it's, it's in motion. Okay. I couldn't handle it. Laura, how do, you, how do you sign up for the District 1 things? Is that off of the app? No. So, well, you could access it from the app. So if you're um, on the city app, you could click the city website. It'll take you straight to the website. And then you would just go to um, subscribe, and there's drop-down menus. You could click there. It'll take you to the page, and then you just click the subscribe for whatever district you'd like. Would you please, could you just share all this information that you brought, that you gave us today in, 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 with an email so that, sure. because I want to share it with other people and I couldn't take notes fast enough. Absolutely. Right. Okay, thank you. you. No problem. Yeah, I appreciate the copies of the slides. Definitely. That, yeah, we'll that would send be emails great. To copies everybody. of the slides for yeah. council and the public, that yeah. would be dynamite. Jessica. Sure. Just a couple of app questions. A, I, I love the idea. I think it's great. I was just curious, uh, when did it go live in the app store? Uh, who did we have built it? Uh, ballpark, how much was it? I assume it came out of the comm budget. And then, uh, as far as Southwest Florida cities go, are we like are we a leader on this? Are we the only one? Does everybody do this? Um, we rolled out our app last year, and I think we were one of the first cities to have an app. Um, I'm not positive on that. I have to check. Um, <clears throat> but we did have the county at the same time had an, already had an alert app. Um, that they had for a few years. And with that app, what they did is they, um, they changed it to lead prepares. I, I would assume they had someone else build it, but I can't speak for them. I would have to find out. Um, as far as us, we put that into our RFP for a request when we redid our website. So one of our requirements that we put in our request for proposals was that they would um, put an app together for okay. us if they were selected to do our website. Cool. So that was rolled into the, you know, the total of the, the website cost. Very Package cool. deal. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Good work. Anybody else? Great. Thanks, Laura. Um, Mayor, Thanks, the, Tony. Yes. the only thing I'd like to add on to this is that this is the time to report to the city any ditches that you feel that need to be of concern. You are able to call City Hall and report that. Um, if it is a private ditch, we will um, provide information to those folks and hopefully link them to the proper person to help with that. If it's a city maintained ditch, you know, we'll update those those persons on the maintenance and, and see what we need to do forward. But this is the beginning of rainy season and we need to be cognizant and looking looking for those opportunities. Also, um, all of our staff has completed level one and level two of FEMA training. I know many of the council has. 
um, we can recirculate also out the links to level one and level two if anyone else would like to, to take part in that. Okay. Everybody good? Okay, we're gonna move on to item B. Approve transportation related projects for the CIP, actually for CIP, no word the, I took the editorial li liberty of adding the word the, and that's green sheet number 20-05122. And Mayor, I'm going to ask Matt to present at the last meeting, there was some discussion about projects that we could be moving forward to. And also, additionally, previously, we had given you update on the um, stormwater infrastructure CIP. This will be our update on transportation CIP. Good, good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, before we get the presentation up here, I, I do want to backtrack a little bit and give you a little update on some good news we received, I believe it was two days ago regarding stormwater infrastructure. Um, we had a second- Hence your prompt phone call, and that's <laughs> a private joke. <laughs> we, we had a secondary uh, grant application for the Pine Lake Preserve project, which is kind of a, a project that melds water quality, habitat restoration, um, cooperation. It's a cooperative effort with Lee County, because it's Lee County owned property, as well as uh, some f component of flood control for the, the neighborhoods nearby. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting project in that it addresses all of those, those items. Uh, we'd had a standing request through the HMGP, which is the Hurricane Irma recovery grant process, but we also um, submitted an application through the Department of Environmental Protection for what is called a 319 grant. It's an EPA dollars that are administered by the Department of Environmental Protection. It does require a little higher level of match but we have not been awarded on the, the FEMA side, and I, I don't believe at this point we probably will receive notice of award. So we, we did get notice of award on the DEP grant, uh, $580,000, and then uh, that will require a match of $370,000 from the city. So we, we have the notice of award. The funding agreement will be forthcoming probably some point later this summer, uh, but that'll allow that project to move forward. One of the unique things about it uh, beyond the, all the things that it treats is it does have the newest listed species here in the state of Florida, the bonnet head bat. So there's a very small window of time that we can go to construction. The, the plans have been done for years and the permits have been issued for about two years on the project. So um, that, that window is in the, the dry season. So we'll, we'll take the efforts as we get the funding agreement through the fall to, to ramp that project up, get it bid out. Uh, get the appropriate environmental monitoring and be ready to construct in the spring. Yeah, no, that, that's fantastic. And with Ellie and everybody on our team, our council, everybody that goes after these grants, I mean, you don't just quote unquote go after them. It's a lot of work, it's labor intensive, the follow up, the personal skill sets, the writing, prose, all of it that goes into it, uh, it's, just, it's just very rewarding to go back actually for everybody on the city of Bonita Springs and the taxpayers to go back and be awarded money that is already theirs. I think that grant, uh, I wrote the initial package for that grant application four years ago. Uh, we were shortlisted in 2017 during IRMA. I really thought we were going to get it. Uh, and then, you know, we had, we had phone calls and, and then it, dry, you know, the well went dry. Right. So we've kept at it for four years and then ultimately um, you know, we were successful, so it's, it's rewarding, but it, it, insight into some of these things don't come overnight. No, um, no, absolutely not, but the strength of council and the citizens, quite frankly, doing this together, so that's great news. Thank you, Matt. Keep up the great work. Okay, so the, the segue, um, transportation issues, uh, I have a, a few brief slides and kind of want to go over some items that that we've talked about uh, that you will see, uh, you know, with numbers in our um, upcoming uh, budgetary process and the capital improvement plan under transportation. Transportation is our number two, and I thought I'd use this slide to talk about really the next large roadway project that's been in our transportation CIPQ. Uh, we wrapped up Logan Boulevard this year, obviously. This is really the next uh, future roadway project. This is part of the quadrant plan of the US 41 Bonita Beach Road intersection. It, what I have there is a, a depiction of 
a roadway alignment that we entered into a settlement agreement back in August with uh, a property owner on. Uh, you've heard me reference it in previous meetings. Uh, it involves community development. It involves our legal team as well as public works, but essentially the agreement allows for ultimately the city to own uh, the property that you see behind the, the public shopping center, the, the public, sh which is called Springs Plaza. Shopping center is in white. Um, the gray shaded area is, is what we would receive. The extra dark gray areas um, actually would be deeded over from the um, shopping center, not from the property owner to the north. Uh, but it is his responsibility in the agreement to provide those pieces to us. So that's what I mean when I talk about a structured agreement. He, he has the responsibility, and he's been in an open dialogue with the, the property owners of Springs Plaza to get us the, the dark gray pieces. Uh, the light gray pieces are his property, and ultimately our agreement would allow for us to pay for a fair market value for that property you see there. Uh, on the left part of the slide, uh, you, you'll see the, a notification we all received here uh, about, about a month ago, and that is the FDOT Project Development and Environment um, Study, or PD&E, which would allow for federal dollars administered through FDOT, the state, to be brought to bear on improvements at the intersection of US 41 and Bonita Beach Road. Those federal dollars could help uh, possibly construct the road that you see there, although they cannot predetermine that alignment. Uh, that, that's a city thing. Um, they could also go to other improvements at the intersection, such as a continuous flow intersection or other ideas that they evaluate. The, the important thing is um, we do remain in contact with FDOT and their consultant, as well as Lee County on this project and will throughout the summer as ideas start to get more vetted. But when the meeting, uh, this postcard is just telling us that they intend on having a public input meeting um, in the winter of this, this year. Uh, when that date gets set, that meeting is of the utmost importance for the folks in Bonita Springs to come out, participate, and let, you know, let those folks know what their opinions are of the ideas that come forward. Because some of the ideas will probably be very appealing to our community, but you know, there's always a possibility that there could be something that, that we're not so comfortable with. Matt, and I'll frame this. Um lightly because we remember a few years back these PD&E studies mean different things to different sure. people. Um, the possibility of a flyover would not be under discussion, correct, at this well, intersection? Well, because it's a federal process, uh, FDOT will not formally rule that out. They won't rule anything. They will not rule that out, and that, that's why I say the meeting is important. They have amended the scope, or the, when they wrote the scope, they specifically mentioned the quadrant roadways in it, you know, which, which was something the city had really undertaken. So that's a, a positive sign. But I think it's very important that we keep um, in close contact with them throughout the entire process because they will not fully negate that, that option. I think to this point, they have operated in good faith and respected the city's will, or, you know, the city's, not will, but uh, intentions. But I think that we all need to keep a vigilant eye on this. And when that date is set, it will be very important that we um, work with them, and I'll continue to work with them throughout the summer. And the health, safety, and welfare of those businesses downtown that otherwise would be taken by eminent domain is not off the table. Correct. Okay. Uh, yes, Amy. Um, do I think we have like a bike, pedestrian, and, and roadway master plan, don't we, in, in Bonita Springs? Uh, do you think we should? Um, bring our, our community and, and the council up to speed on what we sort of aspirationally might want there? I mean, is that, would that be a good idea or, or not? I, we certainly, you know, this, this area has been studied quite a bit, mm -hmm. obviously, with the Quadrant Plan. I mean, as far as this specific area, I think we, you know, we could bring the new members up to speed or I could meet with them individually mm -hmm. to go over it and to, to kind of you know, lay out the, the history of how we got to this point and, and what's going on. Um, you know, with respect to the bike ped plan, I don't know that it, it holds great weight in, in the outcome of what happens at this intersection. Well, well, I think we do want like a bike and a pedestrian part to that. Isn't that in the plan? 
to do that? that? That's in the plan, but it's it's articulated well enough, I think, in the cross sections shown in the quadrant. Because plan I itself. brought this this particular thing up to my community uh, to alert them to the fact that they should pay attention to that, be, because I think it's a very really, really important intersection within our Bonita Springs. But it's been difficult for me. I I tell them to pay attention, but I don't. They need more guidance, I would say. So that's why I brought the, the point up. How could we help to inform our public? Because they're not going to come to a public hearing if they don't know what the, what the issues are. What's at stake? Right. Yeah, what's at stake. So right? If, if you keep us informed, we can circle the wagons. I know I will do my, I can get people. And I'm sure the rest of us, if we realize how important it is, we, we can circle the wagons when and if we need to. We can't, bottom line, with this quadrant study, we have to be cognizant of the fact that the quadrant study almost burned the city down last time. That's what the flyover was about. Mm -hmm. So. We just have to keep a watchful eye on it because anytime you're taking dollars from anybody, there's a lot of conditions that go with it. So, right. uh, let us know what we can do, Matt. And and I just and then I see Fred had his hand up, but for the new members, Matt, and just at a 10,000 foot level or a thousand foot level, um, or for anybody that might be watching at home that didn't know or in the audience, can you give us the 10,000 foot rewind of five years ago? Uh, f five plus years ago, um, the same PD&E process, really what this screen's showing you is two processes. One is a city process, that's that road that's behind Publix, and one is a, a federal state process that has been restarted. Uh, five years ago, that process was underway, and it was very clear that even though the, the folks that commission those studies will tell you that they cannot have a predetermined conclusion, um, it, it appeared from the, the work that led up to it that there was definitely um, a predisposition towards what is called a grade separated solution. Grade separated means a flyover or an overpass. Um, and so, the, the folks on the city council and folks that were actually to come to city council, they, they became council members, led a, a grassroots effort to say, you know, you're, we're not in favor of this. We, we don't believe this is the best contextually solution. It might be the most efficient solution for moving vehicles through our city, but it does not address the needs of the businesses and the community around it and, and will lead to uh, an area that ultimately will deteriorate economically and, and not you know, not be a benefit to the community in the you know the sense of place that they were working on developing. Um, that became a fairly heated discussion. I think it's, it's fair to say. Just a little bit. And ultimately, um, despite contracts being let, actually the work had started. Um, uh, the city of Bonita Springs was able to stop FDOT from moving forward with the study. Horse was let out of the barn, but we went out and got the horse, brought it back to the barn. So, so recognizing there was still an issue in, at the intersection, the city commissioned its own study. It did have um, uh, pre-direction to it, which was to identify four roadway uh, potential roadway um, corridors on all four legs of the intersection. And so, so to evaluate, you know, are there any environmental concerns, are there residential concerns, are there matters of practicality, um, but, but ultimately to deliver a product that said, you know, we think these are the best four um, roadway alignments that you can do. Um, that is what is called the quadrant plan. This leg is um, an amalgamation of one of those routes um, additionally, the city commissioned the Bonita Beach Road Visioning Study, which was a, a parallel track, and that led to land development, actually comprehensive um, plan amendments that indicated at this intersection as well as at Old 41 and Bonita Beach Road that any future development needed to really consider um, road rights of way for the public to alleviate traffic through the intersection. Now, the city would have to pay for those rights of way, but the, the, the property owners would have to, to consider that as they developed um, future development plans. Um, that was challenged. There was a, a lawsuit. Um, and so you see confidential and privileged settlement communication for the public on that map. Uh, we entered into about a two-year lawsuit. 
that did not allow those, those changes to go into effect. Ultimately, we entered into a settlement agreement with the folks that we were in, in, in suit with. Uh, that was in February that the, the suit was dropped, and ultimately the settlement agreement was concluded in August of 2019. Um, out of that agreement, this alignment came forward, so that's what we're, you know, we're working towards. On the eastern side, uh, the city council did prioritize the northern two quadrants. This is what is the northwest. At the northeast, uh, the city was able to acquire the only remaining piece of vacant property that would connect an FDOT pond that fronts a Royal Road to US 41. So we basically bought the piece of property in between. Um, that's a more challenging road to construct, but we did do some further study to understand how we could amend the, the lake shapes and understand how to put a roadway through there. That's probably a little more than the 30,000 no, no, foot. I think, I, no, I think that's Con good. I concurrently, think we, citizens... we met quite a bit with FDOT to talk about what we were doing and to um, see how we could bring their dollars back in, which is what led to the restart of the PD&E study. Um, and they have worked in good faith with us on the idea of context sensitive, but unfortunately, um, that study still brings federal dollars in and they cannot preclude any solution and that's why public input is so important. Right. I think to Councilwoman Karumba's point, it, after we meet with the new folks, you know, maybe we can develop some informational materials that could be distributed to get folks to understand. I, I was more focused on the Bonita Beach Road 41 intersection because that is sort of like an open slate right now. That's where I've been trying to get my community involved because I'm concerned that we're going to go down a path that we're not going to like. And we're saying that we're asking for the, the PD&E, that uh, public meeting, input meeting. I, I would hope that we would have some story to tell there so that when I talk to my District 1 people, I say, if you, if you concur with this, we need help with this. That's, that's what I would like to do. And I don't have any message other than to say what I don't want, and that's not a good message to have. I think a positive message there. Because we went down this path with the PD&E study on the quadrant, and that's why we got into all this trouble. But I think, and everybody just said, traffic, 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 traffic. And that's how I think we came up with the, the flyover. I don't want that to be the message that comes out of our community for the Bonita Beach Road and Old 41. We have to have a different story there. And I would just say, Matt, that was great information and the vote at the time, and then I'm going to call on Fred. The City Council of Bonita Springs voted against the flyover option, which meant it five to two. The horse had been let out of the barn. We went out and got the horse, brought it back to the barn, had another vote on the City Council, which was also five to two, and then got it to go back to a vote at the Lee MPO, and that vote was 10 to 4, uh, literally doubling, 10 to 4, 5 to 2, uh, concurrence of what the city of Bonita Springs uh, had done. And Amy, I echo, I echo your thoughts. Uh, we've, done a, we've done a lot of work since then. We've also had Hurricane Irma and coronavirus since then. So things that have worked swiftly in our city and things that uh, really, you, you, we're, we're digging in and we're getting into the, the weeds, as they say, and getting into the, you know, the infrastructure. Well, it's obviously a critical co conversation, and we will certainly get that message out and uh, have meaningful discussions. Um, and when you can't lay something off, you can't cross over the flyover option. That's not meant to add undue drama where undue drama is not needed. I just thought it should, it should have been said. I don't believe in any way. So once that project got sidelined, that meant because we were at the top of the priority list, the city of Bonita Springs went to the bottom of the priority list, but subsequent efforts in subsequent years have been, Bonita Springs has been elevated, correct, Matt? Will yep. you expound on that just a little bit? You, well, on you, the priority list? And, you, you laid it out pretty well. Um, Basically, we were certainly not uh, not at the top of the priority list for funding, um, and there was a, a very concerted effort by Benita Springs to lobby in, in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Irma 
uh, the Lee County MPO to place this study that you see back on the list, and not only to place it back on the list, but to, to rise it to the top, really with the understanding that although you can't preclude a flyover, um, you would really be sensitive to all of the work that Bonita Springs had put in. We, we submitted, I, I don't know, it's a 270 page plus report um, to the folks that, to FDOT for the solicitation of their consultant to do this PD&E study. I've met with them several times. I remain in communication with them to try and, and impress upon them um, you know, the city's view that a flyover is not uh, really an option in that area. Uh, so we were successful in the spring of 2018 in getting back on the list and then ultimately this was funded actually October of last year, Great. which is, you know, it, it basically went from non-existent on a list to, to the top and funded. Thank you. Fred, you've been patient. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, before I ask Matt a question, I wanted to add one more thing. The big difference Into between, the mic, Fred. The big difference between this study, this PD&E, and the first one, the contract for the PD&E study, the one that we voted on twice, or the mayor did along with others. Fred was a grassroots advocate in those that days. That was a wasn't on the council. I was, I was in the grass. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody was trying to be the lawnmower, too. But the contract, at the very end of it, it said any solution that you come up with must be compatible if constructed with the ultimate solution, an overpass. So the contract basically said it would be an overpass as the ultimate solution. This contract doesn't do that. The only thing I want Matt to do to give everybody a better feeling, even if he doesn't have the exact figures, what about how much more traffic is going through that intersection today than when we were in the midst of this big fight? Quite Roughly. a bit more. It's a lot more. Yeah. Which is not, not always a good thing. Uh, the, the one thing I would add is that... It goes back to that theory, who is it again? <laughs> That's uh, water, I know. But. The, the, the one thing I would add is that the, the city has about $9 million. It spent a million on the, the property, has $9 million basically currently available, set aside for the right-of-way acquisition and construction of the road that you see in, in this large drawing. Um, any additional solutions obviously will require quite a bit of um, money. And so, you know, assuming that the PD&E study can deliver a favorable outcome to the city's view, you will be able to leverage federal and state dollars to, to construct those additional things. This, it's a pretty heavy lift for the city to have committed the dollars that it currently has uh, on what is really a state and, you know, issue. Well, it goes back to the philosophy we talked about earlier on the water projects, right? If you go as we've discussed and we actually for past few meetings now, um, have a grant team and have a team in place that can go after more grant money, hold the line on taxes, not increase taxes, take your pick, say it any way you want to say it, um, because that, that money, that's where you get into the big money. And I know everybody knows that. That's, and I hate to say it because this is going to sound insensitive, not a million here and not five million. We're talking substantial amounts of money are needed for these projects, and why not go after the grant money, the state money, the federal money that our taxpayers have already paid, rather than increasing them with you know, another tax? And that's one opinion of seven, but I think it's a philosophy here that looking at ultimately down, down the road, what's going to be the solution here uh, will, will be the state and the federal money um, in in compliance with this non-flyover study that we can't call a non-flyover study. And I say that just to say I, I, I embrace the process. We're at a different place and a different time now, obviously, than we were five years ago. Um, anything else, Matt? No. Our council? Well, I yes, just, I just Amy? Want to follow up what you said, uh, Mayor, because I think it really is important to apply for all these grants, but uh, we ha are, as, a, as a parent, we always told our children, 
we, the, the person who pays the bills makes the decisions. Um, and I think it is, it can be ex extended to going for grants. This is why I think it's important that we, as a council and a city, we, we have a project that we've identified that is also gonna cost a lot of money when they do something about O41. We should have, I recommend that we have a philosophy or, 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 or a concept of what we want there. Because I think part of the problem that happened with, and it's not resolved yet, with the quadrant is that somehow we didn't get our voice out there soon enough or strong enough. Uh, I could be wrong, but that was my impression. So when we have another project that might cost another, God knows, $20 million or more, let's at least have a concept that we're gonna push for and we get our people out to these public hearings so they have something co that's coherent and is in one voice as much, as much as we can. That's why we have to do the preliminary work now. Now, 20, early 2021 is not, that, is not that far away. When we get through the hurricane season, we're gonna be looking at 2021 pretty easy. So I would like, whatever the concept is, that it's clear and that we could advocate for that within our community. But I'm all on board, get the, get the, uh, get, Get the grants we can, and but you know it has to fit within the shoe that they're giving us. As as they thing. say, and then I'm going to call on Jesse. We're in violent agreement, so that's fantastic, Jesse. I, I was just going to say that I I think absolutely what you said. Uh, you know, having a a sound message moving forward. I I think honestly, I mean, if we're going to be completely honest, I don't think that was the problem last time. I think we had. The two members of the MPO didn't agree with the majority of council, and they went to the MPO and said what they wanted to say, and the council didn't agree, hence it got flipped. So that's kind of the background on it. Um, well, let's make sure we don't do that. Whoever our MPO people are, pay attention. To our, all right, um, our MPO people but, on all the projects. Yeah, all the projects. I think we have a sound voice going into the MPO, and if we do that, I don't think we have any of the problems we had before. Mayor, I just wanted... Sorry, I just wanted to add, we do have building blocks, and what Council Member Carm was discussing is, you know, we, we did adopt the Bonita Beach Road vision, which calls for a multi-purpose, multi-use path all along our major corridor, Bonita Beach Road, all the way to East Bonita, um, as also an exercise trail. It was envisioned through multiple public hearings. The other benefit we have, this time through the process of the PD&E, which requires context-sensitive solutions, is we've adopted the Bonita Beach Road <coughs> visioning uh, statement to our comprehensive plan. Previously, we did not have that in the comprehensive plan, and the state is required to recognize our comprehensive plan and looking at these solutions as well. So um, we also looked at neighborhood uh, bike paths along any additional corridors or uh, commuter roads that we create, like the one Matt showed here. So that continues to grow um, the bicycle pedestrian master plan. So I think there's some messaging that we have building blocks and we can put together. We have the tool design study uh, that shows the intent of providing that walkable community as best as possible. And we followed that with the DPZ study, um, which then has context sensitive solutions to land use. So the land use is supposed to be supportive. The decision making the council makes is supportive of a multi-use path, is supportive of uh, interconnecting uses along the corridor to um, to provide as much traffic control as possible um, in, in interconnecting inter those those opportunities. So I think we have building blocks to provide that message. I think we have visions of a attractive corridor that um, with the combination of tool design and TBZ studies that the city commission, city council if, commission. If I could just just to add to that, so the the comprehensive plan piece that the city adopted out of this study w was huge. And it was in place, the lawsuit was dropped in time that it was in effect before this study was commissioned. And I was keen and made sure that every document Arlene just rattled off was communicated officially to FDOT and its consultants because they do have to review all of that work. And so, you know, the, the previous study, you're right, but there wasn't a big body of work that articulated a vision, um, but all of that had been done. That, that was really all fallout of what happened with the first study, and it was all communicated to the folks that have to take it into account. 
And to keep on council's radar, it's also important that the Benita Beach Road Vision Study also affects Old 41 and Benita Beach Road Corridor. And that has been important with Matt's discussions in DOT with the, uh, with the joint venture with Collier County um, in the Old 41 coming from Collier County north into Benita Springs. Well, sounds okay. like we've done okay. very good uh, work. Amy? Or oh, I was gonna say, it sounds like we've been doing very good work. Thank you. No, absolutely. Fred? And then yeah, I'll come back for Mike and Chris and Laura yeah, two, to two, wrap it up. Two quick points. Number one, I, I hope that we get the gentleman that's doing the PD&E study to model what the total improvement would be if we do the in intersection improvements as well as quadrant and cost it out because it could very well be that you can do all that and still be in what the cost of a flyover would be, which would be much more acceptable. The second thing I want to point out is even though we've got a ton of grant money that we're going to get, there's local match with all of that, and it's substantial in the amount of money that we have to come up with to get that money, and you don't want to lose it. So you don't want to say you can't you may have to find some ways to crank up the revenue, or that means we're not going to do anything else, which is an option. But there, there, is, there is significant local money that we've got to come up with for most of these things. That's it. Thanks, Fred. Mike? Yeah. <laughs> Chris? I think it's important we get the quarter plan done. One of the things that uh, we have looked at in Bonita Bay is uh, the sound being generated off 41, and it's impacting a lot of homes in Benita Bay. Chris, not to interrupt you, but I mean, obviously, for my house, and you know where I live, yeah. sure, we can hear, yeah. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that you go back and look at the FDOT uh, uh, studies that were done, the sound studies that were done in 97, 98, prior to the expansion of uh, 41 to three lanes on each side. They did projections of what the traffic loads would be 20 years hence. And those traffic loads are now in place. In fact, they're being exceeded uh, even on FDOT's uh, projections, which means that FDOT knows they've got a problem. They've got a problem that they have to address, not only with the quadrant plan, the, the intersection, but also with sound. And I, I just think that there's some way that that gives the city some leverage in terms of pushing this project, getting this thing funded, uh, because it, they already know that, that the traffic on 41 exceeds whatever engineering went into the design of the intersection. So I, I think we just need to keep pushing on it. And, and, and I thank you, Chris. Laura? I'm good. You're good? And I just, Matt, I guess one of these things where I'll say, there's, I'm sure there's a better expression, but to lay all the cards on the table, seeing how it, it's the only um, southern evacuation route for Fort Myers Beach and obviously Hickory Island, Matt, does, where does that come into play with these discussions? I, you know, I don't know that it has an, an immediate outcome on, on um, you know, what the design would be at that intersection because the, the ultimate evacuation route really is 75, right? Um, so I, I, I don't know enough to tell you. And there's to, to guys you. like me that'll argue, but you gotta get to 75, right? Uh, right, right, over a week. Um, uh, that would be my counter argument. But um, I, I don't honestly know, I, I'd have to, to see. That has not come up in any of the discussions. I've met with the consultants, I've met with FDOT quite a bit, and that's not been anything that's I ever remember bubbled being up. Talked but it may, years ago, it may as this study really gets underway, it may yeah. be something that, that we have to um, consider. I'm sure it's, it's in there, I just don't know where it's okay. weighted. Um, anybody else? Okay, great, thank you. Thanks everybody. I've got, there's more to this presentation, that was just the road part of it. No, just to get us kicked off. Amy? Oh, I'm sorry. It, it, as it's gonna say, two. <laughs> two more slides? Two more. Two more slides, okay, onward we go. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right, you're, uh, you're there. Um, so, so this is, so I mentioned, that was really our next big road, what we talked about, correct? So these are, the remainder of our transportation items are really geared towards multi-use paths 
and sidewalks. Um, and multi-use paths are not a, a one-size-fits-all uh, solution because, um, you know, in some cases our, our neighborhoods have multiple driveways that connect to, to corridors and it really doesn't make sense to build a, a, a very large multi-use path. But um, so what you have here are current projects. Some of them are sidewalk only. Some of them are kind of a hybrid. They're very wide sidewalks, as, as wide as we could build. And some are, are true multi-use paths. So the, the, in the orange is East Terry Street, I'm sorry, is West Terry Street. If you've driven through the corridor recently, you'll, you'll see it's under significant construction. Um, that is a 12-foot wide multi-use path on the north side of the road. Enclosed drainage, the entire length of the project corridor, which is about 6,000 feet. Um, as well as um, a little bit of road widening to accommodate what is called a buffered bike lane, which is a, a five foot wide bike lane that is buffered from um, vehicular traffic by another two feet um, with roadway striping. So it, it creates more of, a, uh, more of a comfortable drive for folks driving through the corridor as well as for folks riding um, bicycles on the roadway itself. That project uh, will finish in the fall. Uh, its construction has continued on through the coronavirus outbreak. We have had some minor material delays relational to coronavirus, but by and large part, its construction continues. Um, we, I think two years ago, we, we commissioned several sidewalks and, and pathway projects for design. Those designs are basically complete by and large part, uh, and, and the projects that you see in blue on this map are essentially fully designed and we're developing the bid package to advertise bids this summer for construction to start then in the fall and, and, and continue on through the, the early spring. And, and you know, depending on project sequencing, you know, some might go into the summer. Those projects are Maddox Lane sidewalk, Cockleshell sidewalk, which are uh, item A on the map. You can see it, that will create kind of a contiguous loop. Um, Pine Avenue, which uh, runs north from east or from West Terry Street to basically the Recreation Center. It could be funded with some of our community block development grant um, funds. So it, it could uh, take some relief off of uh, where we spend those funds. Item C, which is also eligible for those funds, is Benita Drive. It is a more of a multi-use path on the south side of the road. It connects Old 41 to uh, actually the dog park where there's a trail across through. So it makes a, a very nice connection throughout the city. Uh, there are no facilities along that corridor currently. Um, and what did I miss? Uh, item D, Imperial Shores. Uh, that is the one that is, is just a little, a little bit behind in the design time frame. It's, it's probably at about an 80% design at this point, but we're having to coordinate with uh, Bonita Springs Utilities as it has quite a bit of an impact with them. Uh, that sidewalk uh, would serve a nice connection to an existing sidewalk along Tarpon Way, and there are no facilities there, and that, that fronts up along the, the American Legion. There's quite a, quite a few folks that use that corridor and walk in the road at, at all times of day. Um, I believe that's it. Um, okay, so if you could go to the next slide. <laughs> sure. Next slide and then a five-minute break. Okay. How's that? <laughs> okay. All right. So, so those, by and large part, you will see the ones in the previous slide are really underway and moving towards construction. We just moved some dollars to facilitate construction, and you'll see this. This is really the map of the future and, and really kind of what we're asking council to consider uh, as we go into the next budget cycle. Uh, these are projects that we've been asked about by citizens, uh, by elected folks, um, and just quite frankly, some of them are on our existing um, long-range master plan for, for bike and ped facilities. So they run the gambit. Um, I'll start with item A. I, I've met with a, a fairly large contingent of folks. They, they've been at council meetings a few times to talk about pedestrian facilities along Goodwin Street, which would connect from Old 41, just north of the Imperial River. It fronts Bamboo uh, Village property. And then it would run eastward all the way to Matheson, Matheson Avenue where there is an existing sidewalk on the east side of the street. This is one of the oldest corridors in the city. Uh, it is narrow in terms of right-of-way width and there is no, really no formal drainage in the project. It's just an old street. We don't have a lot of room 
and really to construct anything there, we probably will need to acquire some property throughout the corridor to be able to build um, really more wide sidewalks uh, uh, throughout the corridor. So it would be a sidewalk drainage project. It would be complete reconstruction of the roadway. Uh, I do have a, 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 you know, a planning level estimate for consideration in the upcoming CIP. It is, it's a fairly significant project, but the, the, the fact of the matter is there's a large amount of um, school age kids that walk through that corridor on a daily basis and, and the road is, you know, there's, there's no facility for them and it is a narrow corridor. Uh, and Jersey barrier back in the day. Item B, item B uh, will probably come, we've, we've had the public ask about item B quite a bit. It is really gated between those two black lines that you see there that are, that are running north and south. And it is the remaining stretch of the West Terry Street right away that, that really doesn't have an, an improvement. Um, the, the project that's currently underway stops short at Pine Avenue. That was by design. Um, one of the things that probably kept item B out of being considered by council were um, the fact that you had the railroad crossing but we were able to work with the railroad back in 2018 and, and really improve that crossing and, and, and make a more formalized crossing that would allow for an improvement in that area. Uh, the other issue is <clears throat> the two projects that are shown in, in the, the cautionary that say right away conti railroad contingent are Pauling Lane and Cochrane Lane. And City Council had asked us to look at a conceptual basis about new pedestrian-only railroad crossings to allow kids moving through the corridor to kind of jump up at Pine Avenue, get into the neighborhood, and then cross um, there instead of walking through the corridor where B is. Uh, we have done that. We've, we've looked at it. In, in one case, it requires three pedestrian bridges. In another case, it requires two. Uh, we, we looked at the feasibility, we um, talked to the railroad about it over about a year and a half period of time, um, but most recently uh, we were trying to schedule to, to sit down to talk about uh, the bridges and see whether they would uh, indeed move forward with new crossings. And they informed us they really were not interested in, in, in moving forward, at least at this time, with new pedestrian crossings. So given that, um, really, you know, item B will probably come into the forefront of you'll have this finished product and then, and then you don't. We, we did look, council directed us to, to do a conceptual to see what could be done there that was not a full-blown reconstruction of the roadway. We do have a concept we can bring forward to council. Um, it looks like we could squeeze in probably an eight-foot path on the north side sidewalk with a little bit of a, a planted utility strip in the properties that the city owns so that, that would kind of be on both ends. Um, so we, we would ask you to, to be thinking about that. You know, I can, can bring it forward if, if council wants in this budget for, for something that we could, could do. Um, for the budget workshop, let's yeah, be sure to. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Item C is um, as we started the, the West Terry Street multi-use path project, we, we were reached out by residents on the south side of the road. The south side of the road has a, um, a right of way that really is a drainage swale. Um, it is bifurcated by canals, as you can see there, so there's really no opportunity for, for connectivity you know, further to the south. And, and they had asked that we consider a uh, sidewalk project. So I have looked at it. You know, we, we have the benefit of having all of the cross sections from the current construction plans. It is not a, it's not an inexpensive project. It, it would require enclosed drainage, essentially the length, um, as well as some right-of-way acquisition to get back down to grade and not, not cause issues with the existing um, property. So, so that is one that, you know, has been requested really coming out from, from folks in the community um, and, you know, might be something for consideration in the future or for design or, you know, to look at funding um, further out. Item D, um, the, the downtown project that the city conducted really improved the first block uh, from Old 41 of, of uh, Dean Street 
to the east to Feltz Avenue. Uh, and then beyond that, there's been a, a private development project that has actually placed an eight-foot sidewalk on the south side of the roadway. Currently, there is just a five-foot sidewalk from the elementary school, which is shown as the, the gray shape there, um, on the north side that runs over to Imperial Parkway. It gets quite a bit of travel because there, there are lots of folks that live further to the east. So item D might be something for consideration you know, in future budgets. You know, we could have it out in, in follow-on years for uh, possibly a, a sidewalk extension as well as um, recreating um, the sidewalk on the north side and making it more of a multi-use path. So that was something that's, you know, for council's consideration. It is in our long-range master plan for a multi-use path. So given the, you know, the amount of folks that are using it, it seemed like something for consideration. Item E is uh, the north-south line is Wisconsin Street. I might let Councilman Gibson speak on this. Um, this, this is a sidewalk project that um, we have petitions for and against, uh, where, where the community is really pretty evenly split, uh, that there's a, a large group of folks that do not want a sidewalk there and have reached out to us with a petition a few years ago. At the same time, there was another group of folks that, that asked us to consider it. Uh, so that's the north-south portion of E. The east-west is Carolina Street, which would connect you over to Michigan Street. Matt, just out of curiosity, why didn't the, the, the anti-sidewalk folks, what was, what's the basis of their argument? What, why, why didn't they want it? Uh, I, I think it, you know, it stems from it, you're comfortable with your yard the way it is, and, and maybe you don't want folks walking through, you know, what what you perceive as your yard. Mostly along that system, it is a, it's kind of an open swale. It, it gets deeper in, in, in parts, and so you know, there, no one would be walking in your front yard at this point. Okay. And so you know, I think it's just a change in condition. Um, that's item E. Item G is, is just for consideration. It, it would be, it's Burnwood Parkway. Uh, it, it would just be a sidewalk extension, you know, there's, there's some multifamily up there. There's a shopping center. Um, we don't really have any public outcry for that. It's, it's just something for council to consider in the future. And then item H is the sun trail. So we, we do have that. Thank you. We, we do have item H, which is shown in a little different um, thing here with the yellow circles, that is the Sun Trail. It essentially from Bonita Beach Road, which is this, north follows the railroad corridor. And that is, is more of a regional type project. The city has currently a, a large amount of money kind of you know, set aside. Uh, it, it would take more than what the city has set aside if the city carries all the, the water on that. Um, we have been in regional coordination with the village of Estero. Uh, and, and just now starting really to reach out to Collier County and Lee County on this to see if there's an interest in pursuing this north. It would ultimately end at Alico Road. Can I ask a question on that? Is that what they're calling? The, okay, because I've got a, he's a nice guy, he's an environmental guy. He, he's tagging me on you know, social media every other day about how we really need to get, and me and Betos and a couple other people from Estero, and I think he's calling it the uh, Bonita Estero Bike Trail. And then I was looking in our budget, and I see a large amount of money, but that's not what it's called. It's called the Sun Trail. So I'm wondering, are these the same things? I would assume they are. Um, that is what would provide us connectivity to Estero. Um, so uh, you know, without speaking to the individual, I would assume it is. This, this would run. Go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. It would. You know, if, if Collier County um, expresses an interest, it could run all the way down to, to basically where Old 41 ties into. Right. Actually, the, the rail corridor ends at about Wiggins Pass Road, which okay. is just beyond where Old 41 ties back into New 41 okay. to the south. Collier um, is, is looking at Veterans Extension Parkway, or okay. Veterans Parkway Extension down there, which would connect Livingston over to Old 41 and possibly to US 41. And if they pursue that, um, they, they would have to negotiate with the railroad for a roadway crossing across that corridor. So, so, if so we they're to, starting to come to the table to talk about this if we're gonna, If we're going to make it smaller, you know, you get an elephant one butt at a time, smaller groups, smaller pieces of it, if we were to start it that way, are there any, I just want to know, 
have we actually started? The, I've been led to believe we've started discussions with Estero, but I've never seen anything on it from our side. So I just wanted to kind of ferret that out and see if we've ever. We have, there is funding for the design part of this. This is part of the, the trail that goes from Jacksonville, you know, all over Florida pretty right, much. Right, right. And there are two, is this correct, priority trails. One yes. comes down the railroad and one goes down the beach. Yep. Correct. correct. And I think we're sort of leading, is this correct, we're trying to advocate for this one that goes along the railroad. And don't, isn't there some, like $400,000 that's been... Like five so there, there's 400000 for a feasibility study. But it's not our money, it's the... It's, it's state money state that, that money. we will and be able to... So my question oversee. is, are we somehow involved with directing that design at all? I mean, what's well, our influence on that 400000 or We will be involved with the feasibility study, which a feasibility study does not give you a final design. It gives you what can, you know, concepts as to what can be done, you know, given the, the physical conditions. Um, we will probably have a, you know, along with Estero and the, the others, uh, a large role in, in seeing what the consultants observe, what is practical and what is not. Um, the, the corridor varies. I mentioned with those other sidewalk projects that we needed bridges. That's because when they built the railroad, they dug a huge ditch that, that stays wet most of the year, um, as well as they dug it along natural creeks. And so that, that's why in, in one case, you know, we need three bridges. Well, a feasibility study would start to ferret out the practicality in areas as to how much usable room you have, what makes sense. Okay, so we have and I think we would have a large role in that because we were the pre people that asked for that. So we have money for the study, but the study itself hasn't started. We have state money state. for the study through the Metropolitan Planning Organization. The study has not started. Um, we may be in conjunction with Estero, the folks that actually solicit the study. That, that hasn't been fully ferreted out, but we have the appropriation. So would it be fair to say that when I see this gentleman in the street and or I call him on the phone to say that the, the procedural components to the initial study for the project he's talking about have at least started? The, 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 the issue with this project is probably, I don't know, threefold. Uh, one is you have one individual property owner who you have to work with. Okay. No, that that's the reality. Right. Um, so whatever they they're, whatever they are willing to to work with you on will will dictate what the end product can or cannot be, in terms of valuation or whether they're even willing to sell you anything. Right. Um, the second part is we know from from projects similar to this uh, in Venice that the the ask if we are to be able to get to a purchase type scenario or or something along those lines. The, the dollar amount is, is really a larger burden than the city probably can shoulder, um, particularly regionally. Um, but even within these, the city's own corridor, you know, that valuation will be far more than what we have in our current CIP, which is $5 million. So that's just to buy. That's not to build. And you need all, don't you need all the, I mean, look at it. So, so the, the property the owner, from, from my understanding, is not interested in, in selling off piecemeal that corridor that I mentioned. So the ask or the concept that you can buy it in phases is probably not going to be a consideration. So the, the, the dollar ask is, is larger. So, so that's kind of one problem, right? The problem two is if you have a large dollar ask, you probably need more partners. Problem three is uh, the, not problem, right. consideration three, is that the general public sees the utility in, right. in some other use of yeah. someone's private property right. and would like to see it happen now. Right. Um, it takes money. Does this, is this even able, I mean, the way it looks right here, just looking at this, so say if we don't get H, but we can get, you know, B, G, we have to have all of it for it to work, do we not? I mean, well, the, the way I would look at it is this is an interstate for, if you do this project, okay. it's an interstate for uh, 
bicycles and pedestrians. And that's really what the Sun Trail program right. is designed to do. If you drive Interstate 75 north of here, you'll see a beautiful green overpass. Yeah. Yeah. And that is part of the trail system. And it is literally connecting the west coast of Florida to the east coast. Right. And, and the concept is regional in nature. So if you think of that as an interstate, these are um, local and county roads. They're all city roads, but if you think of these, these are the connection points that get you to the interstate, right? So Terry Street is, is kind of a major connection right, point. Right. It's a major connection point to Imperial Parkway, which kind of serves as a big regional uh, facility for folks uh, doing road biking, but it also would get you to this future project. Is, so these would be the local streets, right? That, that the city would typically take care of. And they are local streets. Okay. This is the regional product. Uh, I don't know, I, I was not worrying about these things when I was a kid, but you know, when the interstate system was being finished, right. um, I don't know whether local communities paid for the interstate or not. I suspect that they didn't. Um, but in this case, it's a bike trail. So you know, the expectation here has certainly been that the local communities would, would build partnerships and participate in that process. But I do want to stress, this is, it is somebody's private property. And, and so it all starts with that yeah. and how we, we work through that. Interesting. Well, I, I was drawn Amy, in. I'm going to interrupt just real quick. And I, just, and I think some of you have heard me just a real quick example. My grandfather Simmons had a 60 acre farm in New Hampshire. And in 1958, Route 95 by eminent domain didn't split, but by kind of like two thirds, one third, oh, his God. property, right? And um, you know, you got mixed feelings on that. Not that Doc's, Dr. Simmons was going to stop Route 95 from reaching the state of Maine. However, um, those you know people feel pretty. They like they like their property, right? They like their 60 acres intact, not split. So I mean, I get from a. They wouldn't go I wasn't back. alive then, but my dad still talks about it. I'll put it to no, the no, no, So Amy, sorry no, no, on that no, note. No, 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 that uh, reinforces the comment that Matt made about this is a private property. And I got involved with, well, I was always involved, sort of interested in the Sun Trail because I was uh, um, familiar with rail to trails up in New York. Um, and I thought, well, this sounds like a great, a good idea. But when uh, Deputy Mayor O'Flynn uh, resigned. He was sort of the point right. person for this, and I sort of, and he asked me to take it over. So I contacted a few people that have been working on this, and and it is absolutely true that negotiations with the private property owner, which is the railroad uh, owner, um, is a stumbling block both for the financing and progress there. Um, it absolutely also is a regional issue. I mean, there's no way that we at Bonita Springs can do this without Lee County being a full partner in this. And they have, they have an interest and a responsibility. So this is why I, I'm in, I was really fascinated about this uh, appropriation that's coming in for the conceptual design here, because I think that's where we could have some input. And there's something called over the fence evaluation, which I never even knew that expression, um, which is the concept that people say, look at where it is, and then it, look all around you, and then you assess the value of this property by just a visual inspection, which ends up costing everybody a lot of money. Uh, so there are concepts here that I think we would follow, but this is, I don't think we're going to see it in my life, not my, my council lifetime. This is not going to happen in three years when I'm going to be off the council. Uh, but it's something that I think we need to have Matt involved with. We need to be in touch with our Estero people. We definitely have to be in touch with Lee County because it's not going to go anywhere unless they have it in their long-term vision. And I think the, the bike trail in Sarasota or Venice, I think that was like $50 million, but that was, wasn't that paid for by the county? I don't know if there was any city participation in that or not. I, I'm not, I don't know. I, I know that it, there were some pieces, and so the, the first mm -hmm. piece, and I, I don't know whether the, the advocacy group, and I don't know whether they contributed money or whether maintenance, but right. you ended up with a strong advocacy group right. that recently led about two years ago to the purchase of another large stretch. Mm -hmm. um, 
the, the thing is, if you think of it as an interstate, um, it's a regional issue. It touches multiple jurisdictions, right. and the, the, it's a private property issue. And so we have to be sensitive to that, and that means that it's a dollar issue. Correct. And, and I think your assessment about the time is correct. Every member of the public that I've been at where we talk about this would love to see it tomorrow. Um, but I, th I think the dollars and, and the, the coalition, right, mm -hmm. aren't, aren't fully formed yet. And, and perhaps this feasibility study where we can say, mm -hmm. well, there's two creeks there. I don't think we can build anything alongside it. You know, we probably need to buy this portion mm -hmm. Uh, outright, uh, I think that will help people maybe you know start to coalesce around you know what is the feasibility and, and what does this really look like. We if we look at the dollars from Venice, we know that it's a sizable ask, mm -hmm. and that's just to buy the property, not Correct. to improve it. Yeah. In regards to the feasibility study, who's who's is it the county that has to actually do the initiation on that portion of no. this? No, the money was, was received regionally through the Lee County MPO on a joint request from Bonita so Springs and the village of Estero. So that makes it more complicated. What, what, I'm sorry, what was the, what, I didn't hear the end part of it. We jointly requested with the village of Estero the $400,000 oh, okay. for so, the study. So it's a, it's, a, it's a dual municipality, you ask, so that means that we have to have a coordinating committee or something. Well, it, it probably should we're be not there yet. It should be through the staff because you, you understand how this works a lot better than other people. Anyway, um, I think we should continue. I'm happy that we have that money, uh, and I hope we follow what we're going to have to apply the pressure constantly from now for the next 10 years. <laughs> so those of you that are going to be reelected and not uh, term limited, it's your job, but, um, but I'm working on it. Also. Amy, this might be one of those things where you can get on early before it's cool, like where pe the water people got on before it was cool to be yeah. water people. The bike people and the trail people can get on yeah. before it's cool to be no, bike it's, and it's trail really people. No, it's really an interesting, I mean, if you intellectually, it's very an interesting project, so it's cool. I love it. Not that it's not cool now, I mean, honestly, yeah. honestly. But it, it's a lot of, a lot of Legos in, in the, in the mm -hmm. set, right? So, so honestly, I, a lot of pieces that have to go together. Uh, are you? Done well, I was just going to, if, if you're finished about the Sun Trail, I, the, the, kind of the intent here, some of these I have very detailed um, planning level estimates, but it would, it would allow you to you know, make a decision whether you want to do it in the next year or to you know, start the engineering process or to you know, maybe do it in two years' time. Um, some of them I don't, and I was just and I don't have them as part of this presentation. They would come at, at the next meeting, but I was just curious, you know, is there any consensus amongst this list of any that you would, you know, you definitely want to see that, you know, the mayor mentioned uh, item B. Uh, I have item A, item C, item D, and the Sun Trail all basically queued up. The other ones I really did not um, have sitting, in, you know, in, in any immediate budget. Do you, you know, is there, is there any? Would you repeat which ones? My question was, do you want? Would you help us prioritize? I first of all, I any, did with the prioritize letters. and give a price tag any, because any you got safe eight through eight. My opinion, any right. conceptual, any safe road to school, anything related to connectivity with the school should definitely be a go, and and I definitely think we should finish the the Terry Street project. But you know, you sh you should help us to prioritize it, and money is also an issue. The ones that are shovel ready, and the dollars are already there. But nothing, nothing here is shovel ready. Because I letter that H, was the previous Matt, list. could cost more than A through G combined. So, so, so a little insight, right? Is, right? Yeah. I listed them A through H in in terms of expense. No, in terms of personal priority. Oh, <laughs> personal liberties, Feeney. And, and it's, 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 it's not to say anything about H, but H is clearly a very long-term um, endeavor. So A. <laughs> With that in mind, Amy. <laughs> well, I mean, there's no, we don't, we, we're, there's nothing we can do on H anyway. So I mean, that's okay. It's not right, a, a right, 2021 right. project. Right. Okay. I think, honestly, the one you said that there was no public outcry for, I mean, that's an easy one to scrap. 
Yeah, I had D in outer years. We, do, we haven't sat down and, and put pen to paper exactly on you know, dollars, what, what is fully fundable. But I would say that you know, it, design of this, this doesn't, you're not going to be funding construction of something like this uh -huh. in, in year one. You might be able to in B. I, and I have not worked a number up for B. That's, that's the one uh -huh. caveat. But I would think that A and B um, probably are your most likely candidates for, for activity in the next year's budget. Design and possibly design construction on B. C, um, you could move to design uh, in, in that same time frame, or you could, you, know, you could pause it a year and move to design the following year. I don't think, you know, C comes out of a request for a sidewalk on the south side of an area that, that we have invested $4 million in improving. That improvement's not fully constructed yet. It will be finished in the fall. And, and maybe you know, the improvements will be acceptable to the folks along the corridor as a stopgap. Um, I don't know. I've met with them quite a bit. And I think that they would like to see it move to design uh, really in the next year's budget. Uh, I think that either approach is, is probably acceptable. D is, is probably really something for the future. And that's what I had thought. Uh, e is, is something certainly worth consideration, however, if, if we have an equal amount of people that are for it, an equal amount of people that are against it, I, you know. It's tough to. It's hard. Yeah. We have enough trouble. <laughs> the main issue there is the people that are for it are actually the ones that live on the street. The people that are against it typically don't live on the street, you know, when you look at the petition. So. Oh, well, then uh, that's different. That's but you're balancing dollars and need. And a little yeah. nimbyism, yeah. Yeah. right? Well, not technically. But, um, and the, the truth about A and C are both are going to require right away. And to get to buying right away, you have to have a design. Because you have right. to know exactly how much right. you need. Right, right. right. reverse exactly. So, so if, you move, cool. if you move A and C into design phases in the, the next year, yeah. you will be able to get to the answer of buying property right, for the following year. And so, so there's, there's some decision points there. So it, it, you know, it probably doesn't hurt to move both of them to design. Yeah. Um, if we went back a slide, Cockleshell extension had been designed since 2016. Right. You know, it, it just waited until Maddox came along. So that's what we call shelf plans. That is what a shovel-ready project is. Right. So you could, oops, oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, <laughs> but you could certainly move A and C to that, that point. You also have another point in both of those where you're going to have to acquire property. And so, so A and C are the ones you said that could be moved I, responsibly? Well, A, B, and C are probably B, for and consideration C. in next year's. What's wrong with C? You don't like C? No, A, B, and C. No, no, it's, it's a good project. It's, it's just. It's a good project. It's just Matt's third choice. That's all. It's third. <laughs> but he skipped to D. It's in the three hole. D, D, I think, is just something for the future. Okay. I, I really do. I, I don't think that you have a sidewalk there currently. I think it's, it's just to put on your radar screen. And what are we doing in F? Is that the thing that we were talking about with the that's another That's another one where you're going to have to buy property. I haven't looked at it in detail. It comes up from time to time. Um, Not the guy from the preserve, Gary. With no, the, no, this is with north the of there. OK, gotcha, OK, different. But th there's folks that walk along there. It abuts American House where there are some facilities. Yeah. But it's one of the older plats in the city. And um, it, it will require some right-of-way acquisition. Even though there's a road there, you don't have much right-of-way width. I think you've got to preserve on the north side. So it, it's another little kind of challenging, complicated one. And um, I just put it on there because it, it had been talked about last year or two years ago. It comes up from time to time. It, it's probably another one for consideration. What, we, what we've done is we've, we've advanced a suite of projects. And they're basically ready to be constructed. So what's the next suite, and what's, what's in the queue following? And that's really where I see this stuff, is this is the queue following. But, but that's your decision. I, I just, those are my thoughts. Uh, do we need a motion to do that, or procedurally to move A, B, uh, Well, you know, 
I have a lot of it worked out unless you start really moving into to the, you know, the lower areas. I, I pretty much have it. So it, it, I'm just really just trying to get a sense uh, if, if that's. I mean, I, is I'm there anybody, I hate to say it, I'll just put it to this way. Is there anybody opposed to this? No. With, well, with what, Matt? Advancing ABC. in this summer's budget workshops discussion on A, B, and C? No, let's do that. Is that? I'm in favor of, of following A, B, and C as recommended by Matt. Second. OK. Yeah, that's great. Hey, Chris, is that all right? Mike, Fred, sound all right to you? No, but we, and we'll have discussions on the others so, in greater detail at the summer workshop. So, so there's one thing we could do with, with the others is, you know, you've done this in the past where you show them, but they're, yeah. they're not funded in the immediate year. And, you know, I could, I could do some of that because that sends the message to the public, you know, this like is Like your next fantasy week. football roster. They're on your team, but they're on the bench. Right. Right? That's so you. You can keep an eye on them, but if they're not your starting team. Maybe a way if, to think if, about it. Um, okay. Uh, so there's been a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Roll call, please. Mayor Simmons? Aye. Councilman Corey? Aye. Councilman Gibson? Aye. Councilman Forbes? Aye. Councilwoman Carumba? Aye. Councilman Purden? Aye. Councilwoman Carr? Aye. Okay. Um, Laura, so, so about an hour ago, no, that's an exaggeration, you wanted to take a break, so. It's 11.30, why don't we break unless there's objection until 11.45? Okay. We'll restart then. Thanks everybody.